Coming up this week on the MarkCast. Well, here we are. It is the long-awaited, much-anticipated MarkCast interview with the Commissioner of the Canadian Football League, Randy Ambrosi. Who would have thought 15 months ago, you know, the XFL, CFL entering discussions in the attempt to grow the game? Well, here we are. We have landed an exclusive sit-down, long-form, non-three-down nation-sanctioned interview with the Commander-in-Chief of the Canadian Football League, Randy Ambrosi. I hope you enjoy you know, most of the criticisms when they come are come from a good place. They come because people are passionate about the league and they want to see the league succeed. So, you know, you just have to, as somebody famously said, you got to put on your big boy pants and uh, and go to work. And that's what I've tried to do. And then we don't only talk XFL on this podcast, but we do actually podcast about the XFL as well. Lots of XFL news to talk about. We have leaked cities via the XFL shop. Who would have seen that coming? We also have lots of hires, offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators, directors of player personnel. I have Brandon and Evan come on to help me out. I'm glad that we're starting to see more of the pieces come together for the cities and the league essentially right before they formally announce it, which I assume is pretty soon. We're also talking about the Together XFL lawsuit with legal expert Darren Heitner. Darren gives his thoughts. You know, are they just looking for publicity? What does Sue Bird and crew want with the Rocks XFL? Darren gives his thoughts. I was a bit surprised that they actually went ahead and filed a complaint in federal court. Then we truly are covering all facets of alternative spring football this week. Greg Mescal, we play-by-play announcer for fan control football stops by the show they have their big championship game coming up this weekend there are other leagues obviously out there uh usfl or xfl coming nfl of course to me yes it's all football but the FCF isn't isn't really a direct competitor to that stuff as far as I'm concerned. And then we are still in the midst of USFL season. We are approaching week nine. Javon Alfred of the Sporting News stops by. We're previewing week nine, talking playoff potential and everything else. Please like and subscribe. What are we doing here? Crazy week. Thank you all for your support. Hey guys, welcome to the Mark Cast. Reed here. Uh, what do we even say at this point? Uh, where where are we? Is this real life? Uh, biggest interview we've ever had to date this week. You know, CFL Commissioner Randy Ambrosi joining the show, ruffling all sorts of feathers with the three downers north of the border. Uh, you know, uh, been lighting up the Twitter landscape this week. Why would the Commissioner of the Canadian Football League go on an XFL podcast? Well, you know, we do good work here, and if you've never been, uh, if you've never listened to the podcast before, potentially we're getting a lot of new listeners this week. We cover all facets of spring football on the show. I have my BC Lions hat on, America's CFL team, as we call them. I have my Philadelphia Stars jersey on from the USFL. They are my team of choice for the 2022 season there. Cover all sorts of stuff. We talk XFL on here. We even have fan control football coverage today. Greg Maskell, lucky enough uh, to have him stop by. The league reached out to us. Imagine that. Imagine that. You know, USFL, uh, XFL, CFL. I mean, XFL, you're still coming on board here, but imagine that, you know, USFL, CFL reaching out to us uh, to get people on the show. But I really appreciate it. In all seriousness, uh, you know, the CFL offices, uh, Lucas over there, you know, putting up with my constant emails, uh, communication, trying to set this up today. Uh, I don't even know what else to say right now. It's going to be a loaded show. Randy is lots of fire. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy that. You know, I, I think I did a good job, you know, kind of getting him to, to give some answers. I had a lot of like, well, you know, Randy is really hard to pin down. I think we did a good job. You know, I did work in news for a long time before I, I started my you know, wedding business in this crazy world here. So, you know, I think we did a good job there. Lots of good discussions with Evan and Brandon coming up, all the XFL stuff. I mean, the cities are all but confirmed at this point, but always great. You know, we had the big leaked uh, brand uh, revamp, you know, that whole promo video uh, leak uh, the night before that whole announcement came out. Does not surprise me at all. That the XFL would have you know more things leaked now. Like you gotta pay attention, guys. Like the private, I don't know. I'm not the web developer guy, but you know, I we don't have we have very smart people in the all football world, right? Like the Jake Henry's of the world, Mark uh, Mark Perry. I know we had a listener send over the, the XFL stuff, but like 
I mean, we're not rocket scientists here. I mean, I just let's let's tighten up the ship a little bit, but it is fun. I like seeing all those leaks come out. Wonderful conversation as well with Darren Heitner, a you know, legal expert. Darren's been covering the Together XFL lawsuit. I'm uh, really excited to pin down uh, Darren and get him on the show. Lots of thoughts from Darren. You know, is the is this Together lawsuit uh, is it a viable uh, threat to the XFL? You know, what are we looking at here? I think Darren kind of lays out things uh, pretty interesting. Darren, you know, does this. He's a professional sports IP trademark lawyer. Uh, trying, uh, we'll probably get Michael Cohen on as well, but Darren's been busy scheduling wise. So I thought, you know, friend of the show, Michael Cohen, our uh, Beverly Hills trademark lawyer, uh, maybe we'll get him on next week, but I really wanted to pin down Darren uh, when I had his availability. Uh, great conversation with Greg Mescal uh, over with Fan Control Football, like I already said. Really appreciate them reaching out. I know I haven't always been, uh, maybe they uh, have the kindest words towards the crew over there, but at the end of the day, it's all love. I, you know, I just talk stuff here and people get mad and whatever, but it's all fun. I don't take any of it personally. I, I know, like I said, even if you don't like me, I hope you'll enjoy the content on the show this week. And then Javon Alford coming on, you know, previewing the USFL stuff. Really appreciate that. I've got a couple more good USFL guests lined up this USFL hating podcast. I am uh, to talk through the end of the season. Maybe we'll try to get Brock Heward back on, like he was saying, kind of previewing the championship game. But should be good that way. Uh, thank you guys all for your support, getting us to this position where we would even have the opportunity to reach out and interview the commissioner of a you know major a North American you know, sports league. Really appreciate that. I do not take that for granted. Like I already said, thank you guys all for the Canadian uh, Football League office for you know helping to facilitate all of that. Hopefully, I did us proud, America. You know the the dumb American that uh, you know who knew like 15 months ago we knew nothing about Canadian football that we're growing together. We're learning. Uh, we have the big uh, you know, season kickoff. Hopefully you watched our live stream last night with the guys over at the Alouette Flight Decks podcast and uh, CFL News Hub. If you haven't uh, already checked that out, that'll be on the YouTube stream. Really fun that way. But should be a good weekend of CFL action. BC Lions hopefully taking the W for their big home opener. Uh, I think I've rambled long enough. Thank you guys all so much again. I'll pop by at the end of the show uh, to say goodnight and uh, thank, just uh, you know, God bless everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. Well, if you had told me 15 months ago when I woke up to the email, you know, we're an XFL podcast, XFL and CFL are uh, having discussions, and now I'm interviewing the commissioner of the Canadian Football League, you would have to pinch me. How are you doing today, Mr. Randy Ambrosi? Yeah, I'm doing great. You know, it's exciting. Uh, it's, uh, it's Tuesday. Our 2022 season kicks off on Thursday evening in Calgary. I, I am fortunately going to be there and get a chance to watch our, our kickoff game for the 22 season in person. And I'm really excited. And look, it's just been, you know, two years for, you know, for people all around the world, two very difficult years for everyone. Certainly it was difficult uh, in the world of sports and it was difficult on the CFL, but uh with the new labor agreement in place with our players, the long-term win-win uh, arrangement with our players. And now, uh, you know, the season about to start, I couldn't be happier. Yeah. I mean, first off, I just welfare check on Mr. Ambrosi. How are you doing? Because it's been a very strong, you get a lot of flack for kind of everything online, right or wrong. I mean, how are you doing? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm fine. You know, you, uh, you can't possibly uh, know what it's like to be in this chair until you're in this chair. So certainly there's been a lot of learning. Uh, we've been through uh, a very difficult part, uh, time, perhaps one of the most difficult in the league's history. And um, you have to, you know, somebody's got to be responsible and accountable for, you know, all we've been through. And I, I certainly feel, uh, feel both of those things, accountable and responsible. But in the end, most of the, you know, most of the criticisms when they come are come from a good place. They come because people are passionate about the league and they want to see the league succeed. So, you know, you just have to, as somebody famously said, you got to put on your big boy pants and, uh, and go to work. And that's what I've tried to do. Yeah, because you have a very different role, you know, than a traditional commissioner. You know, we think of like in the NFL or whatever. I mean, how do you view yourself in that role and balance, you know, you, and obviously I'll have a follow up here, but you know, the, the needs of, you know, the community owned teams and, you know, privately owned teams, how do you have to balance all that? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to learn and you, uh, you have to, and I have learned uh, to appreciate that this job is different. It's not a traditional chief executive role because it doesn't come with a, uh, 
It doesn't come with the same kind of authority that goes with a traditional uh, command and control structure. Uh, this you, you have to work with nine teams. You have to work with nine different points of view. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration in this role and more, more than anything I've ever experienced in my life. And you, and you have to learn how to appreciate the opportunity for that collaboration to move the league forward. And, you know, frankly, I'd say if I look back now, uh, having, having created a revenue sharing plan that's uh, been absent in the CFL for four plus decades, having created this new, um, helped to create this new relationship with Genius Sports and this business we call CFL Ventures, and then uh, uh, the longest, one of the longest uh, collective bargaining terms in CFL history in a win-win. I actually think we've created through that collaboration, we've created a, a whole new foundation for the league's long-term success. So in many ways, you know, I, I'm feeling a sense of pride that, uh, you know, we've learned together, we've worked together and, uh, and we've persevered through a very difficult time together. I do agree that I think that in terms of a lot of the stuff you guys have done, even coming out with the announcements at Grey Cup, we were lucky enough to be there for that. Uh, you know, getting all of this taken care of now, what do you view as the, the biggest hurdle now for the CFL, you know, having survived COVID and the XFL and, and everything else? Well, look, I, I think we've got a great strategy. And so, it, you know, if, if step one is doing the analysis and understanding, you know, what our opportunities are, Step two is developing the strategy and step three is putting the, the pieces in place. So the pieces are the, you know, the examples of the pieces are the things I just mentioned, you know, uh, a, a revenue sharing plan, which helps elevate all nine teams, the, uh, the genius partnership, which helps us to elevate our league in general, and then transforming the conversation with our players from its old format into more of a partnership. Uh, then that leads to the next step, and that is execution. And you have to, you know, that the hurdle is to do the work now. It is to take advantage of all of the things that we've accomplished over these two difficult years, and it's to make sure that we're methodical uh, and and acting with a sense of urgency to get, you know, to get to take advantage of the work we've done. So, in in some ways, that's not really a hurdle per se, not in a traditional definition. But I, you know, frankly, I feel good for the league. I think that we've set ourselves up for long-term success. But you know, like every business on the planet, you've got to earn it. And and now we got to go to work and execute against this opportunity that we've created. Well, I agree with that, and and kind of proving that right. It, it got a little tenuous there with the CBA talks, right? You know, we were told all along it's going to be easy, and then got delayed, and obviously we had everything back and forth. But how do you, you know, do you worry that maybe that's left sourness in in players' mouths, or you know, kind of having gone through and really had to take a stand, right? Take a work stoppage, and now come back and, and play. You know what? I, I, I have a I have a great confidence in our players, and we've worked really hard on building a, uh, a good relationship with them. You know, obviously, the collective bargaining process is by its nature sometimes confrontational, and I think we can all say that we've experienced that. But I but I would hope, and I believe that the players know that we want we want to do good things together. We want to succeed together. In fact, the fundamental nature of this collective agreement is the creation of an alignment of our interests that we're looking for a win-win so look when i when i head to calgary uh, this week and then uh, on what thursday and then vancouver for saturday i would be thrilled to shake hands with each and every player and then be able to talk with them about the future that we're going to build together and i and i believe that's the spirit in which our engagement with the players will i think that's how it'll be defined going forward what are you most proud of, of the things that were agreed to in the CBA? What do you think is the most powerful part of it? Well, the length of term is certainly one because in the five years I've been in this chair, we've had four, we've had four collective agreements that had to be negotiated. Uh, so that's one thing. I think the revenue growth sharing is to me, that was something that uh, we were talking about with the governors going all the way back to 2018 and 2019. Because that, in my mind, that creates a partnership between us and the players. But I'm also really happy for the players. They got, uh, you know, in the second contract and beyond, they got an opportunity for uh, guaranteed contracts. I think that's going to create roster stability. 
you know, I'm excited that we've got a, a, a provision for some mental health care. I, I think the extension of our medical plan benefits, those are things that are really good news for the players and I'm excited about. But just generally, I think it's a this is a deal that we should look at both bargaining committees, the one representing the players and the one representing the league, and we should say thanks to them. Because I, I think while it got a little bit messy at the end, I think we can say that on uh, all things being equal, I think they did a remarkable job of coming up to, uh, to creating a whole new platform for the relationship between the players and the league. So I, I'm, I'm, pro- I'm probably most proud of that. Uh, when the CBA got passed, you know, we were live breaking. We, we had Jim Mullen on the show, Daryl Davis, among others, kind of comments worrying about the, these loopholes coming up with the ratio, you know, next year and beyond, right? And you can play 49% or whatever. We're moving spots around. I mean, do, do you wish that they would have pushed it and held for more just solely Canadian spots in that ratio agreement? Do you worry about any of that kind of weirdness happening with coaches and things moving forward? No, you know, we'll, we'll work out a, we'll work out a structure and, uh, you know, the coaches and our football operations people will well understand how it's to work. Look, in the end, it was really designed to create more uh, flexibility for our coaches. You, you know this well, you're, uh, you're where you're rocking your BC Lions gear today. And, and I know you, um, you have great passion for our game and for our league. Uh, you know that the game uh, is often uh, one of the ch- most challenging issues is injuries. So this is going to create some roster flexibility. But one of the features of being able to nationalize an American player is that it will reward those players for staying on our teams and living in our communities, which is a hallmark of the CFL and has been for decades. So I think the positive side, the real positive side, is that it's going to reward uh, some of our American players uh, for their commitment to our teams and to our communities. That's really positive. And it's going to create some roster continuity for our fans. And then ultimately it's going to give roster flexibility to our coaches. Those, those three things, that's the, that's the perfect trifecta. And I'm really excited about that. The, the details of the logistics, we, we'll work that out. And I'm not concerned about that in the least. Uh, in terms of, I think it's great, right? And so, you know, I, I as an American, you know, incentivizing right that them being in the community. I just I've seen lots of comments about you know the the Canadianness of the CFL and wanting to make sure that's preserved. And and do you as someone that you know Canadians you know been in the league, you know, benefited from the ratio? I, I just wonder if that do you do you wear that on your shoulders that you all want to make sure that you you preserve that side of things as well? Yeah, absolutely. But I I take the other side of it. Uh, you know, frankly. I think we can all say watching uh, the development of Canadian athletes, there's 24 Canadians now on NFL rosters, the most in, most in history. There's Canadian athletes succeeding in every sport in the world. Uh, you know, Andrew Wiggins is playing in the NBA uh, finals. Uh, in the NHL, uh, some of the best players in the NHL playoffs obviously are Canadians. Canadian athletes, inclu- including Canadian football players, are more than capable of competing. In fact, in some ways, what we're trying to do here is to kind of break down that stigma that Canadians, in order for Canadians to play in the Canadian Football League, they have to be protected. Frankly, I don't believe that. I, I think Canadians, through the course of, uh, of, of the history of our league, have proven I played with Pierre Verschevel and Rod Connop, who are in the Hall of Fame. I played with Dan Ferroni, who's in the Hall of Fame. I played with all, I could just go on and on, all the players that I played with and that I know that uh, are some of the greatest players in CFL history. And I know they were more than capable of competing with or without a ratio. I think we frankly need to change that narrative that Canadians are in the Canadian Football League because they're great football players, not because they're uh, protected by a ratio. I like that. I like that. Uh, circling back, you know, we were talking balancing your roles right between the team owners. Uh, obviously, uh, Larry Tannenbaum's comments this week from MLSC talking about you know the the league structure wanting to be changed, unhappy you know with Toronto and Vancouver and all that. Uh, I've asked a lot. People want you to your comments on that. I'm sure you've seen that. So, what, what would you like to say? Well, look, I have an incredible respect for uh, for Mr. Tannenbaum. You know, he's a remarkable person, has made a not only a great contribution to sports in Canada, but around the world. And certainly he's uh, made a tremendous contribution to Canada. Look, I, I think what I would say about his comments is I think we, we know 
that amongst our nine uh, teams, our nine governors, there uh, isn't always agreement on all the points. But what we do is we learn to work together and we learn to give uh, everyone an opportunity to, to kind of speak to what they believe is the right path forward. I, I think the league has made tremendous progress over these past two years under very difficult circumstances. But you have to acknowledge the commitment that MLSE and Larry Tannenbaum have made to the Canadian Football League. You have to acknowledge that even under those very trying circumstances, they have stood with us shoulder to shoulder with their colleagues. So, look, I, I think you, you can always accept that not everyone has the same point of view, but you can respect them and be willing to forge ahead. And we've got a season we're about to open on Thursday night, uh, Calgary hosting uh, Montreal. And we know that Toronto's got the first buy of, buy of the season and will be at home the following Thursday to host the Montreal Alouettes here in Toronto with MLSC as their owner. And MLSC is committed to the CFL and uh, and we're committed to the Toronto Argonauts and, the, and MLSC. So, you know, in the end, there's always room for some... Um, reasonable discourse amongst amongst friends and colleagues and then you tip your hat acknowledge your respect for each other and you press forward uh, i wanted to ask we had a friend of the show now mar doman on the show a few weeks ago owner of bc lions talking uh he let slip a little bit about this halifax expansion right i know you've had comments on that you know and i think the next five years if i wanted to if i wanted to go on the bet regal app and, and put down you know what, what are the odds here we're seeing the halifax expansion in the next five years I, I think it's high. Look, I, I mean, it has been uh, for as long as I can remember, and sadly, that's a long time now. Uh, I can tell you that I think it is the it is an amazing opportunity for the Canadian Football League. Just, first of all, just structurally to have an even number of teams, to have the tenth team, is really important. But that region is really important. Remembering that we sold out that game in one hour. Uh, the game that's going to be played in Wolfville. Uh, it's an amazing re region of Canada filled with amazing people with a passion for sports. And somehow, some way, and we got to do it right, but somehow, some way, we need to get our 10th team. We should, we, I am, I'm passionate about having that 10th team in Atlanta, Canada. And, uh, you know, on behalf of the Canadian Football League, going to work diligently side by side with our governors to see if we can't make it happen. I, if, if you're if you're looking to make that bet and the time horizon is five years, I think that's pretty smart money. I like that. I think a lot of people will be happy with that. I mean, that would be the biggest thing. You know, you want to talk about accomplishing things. I have a voicemail here, a longtime listener, Kyle. This was a question I was going to ask anyway, so I want to make sure we get Kyle for that. We have lots of fans that write in every week. Uh, hopefully you can hear this audio as I play it. Hey, Reed, what's going on? Great guest for this week. Randy, I hope you're listening. I got a question for you. I've been a fan for a long time. I'm situated in uh, Montreal, Quebec. I've been actually following the league since 96 for as long as I can remember. And this is after the expansion down south to the States. Um, you know, I love the league and I love youth sport football. I love all kinds of football. Um, and, you know, I'm just thinking about my kids. I'm thinking about development and I want, you know, the league to stick around for a long time. And I want it to remain interesting. What I want to know is, is there a possibility for expansion aside from the Schooners that there have been talks for a long time? Um, is there a possible for expansion down south to the States uh, or for other cities uh, in, in the elsewhere of Canada? Thanks, and hopefully looking forward to your response. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to, uh, to Kyle for that question. Uh, look, I, I think one of the things that I really appreciate about our Board of Governors is that uh, they're, uh, they're very pragmatic, but they're, they're people of great vision. And they have the ability to see uh, longer term and 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 search out the potential for long term opportunities. Look, right now our goal is to use this platform, which is revenue sharing, a uh, the Genius Sports Partnership, the new long term CBA with our players, all the hard work we've done to create a better, stronger CFL. To use that to grow to our tenth team. And then after that, to say, okay, what's next? You can't get to 12 until you've got to 10. And you can't get to 14 until you've got to 12. Uh, and frankly, after we get to 10, all expansion that this league should consider should always be done in multiples of two. Uh, but again, I have the pleasure of getting up every day and working with governors of great vision uh, who are natural leaders in everything they do. And I know that 
as opportunities emerge and ideas surface, they're going to want to look for every way to make the CFL the biggest, strongest league it can possibly be. In fact, you know, we read interestingly, one of the things that we went into our product review process talking about is we want it to be the funnest, fastest, most entertaining brand of football on the planet. And uh, some of the changes we made this off season, particularly moving those hash marks in, our field has almost 700 square feet more space per player than that other brand of football. It's a giant canvas. It is a huge, it, to me, that represents the CFL and Canadian football more than anything else that we do. The big field is the canvas. I think that we're on the verge of, uh, of one of the most entertaining seasons in CFL history. And so one thing that has is success creates opportunity. And for us, all the hard work, all the work that all of our teams have done, that MLSE, that the owners in Montreal, uh, uh, Gary uh, and his father-in-law, his late father-in-law, their commitment to Montreal, uh, the Ottawa Sports and Entertainment Group, Bob Young and Scott Mitchell in Hamilton, Winnipeg, Saskatchewan and Edmonton are three amazing community teams, Calgary Sports and Entertainment and all that they need, and now Amar Doman. What I'm, I'm excited that we've done the work to create a new foundation for a new future. And then, and then that future will create opportunities for further, you know, for further expansion down the road. But today it's about a 22 season that's fun, fast and entertaining. And the sky's the limit, frankly, on how much success we can have long term. I'm watching the clock. I have two questions left. I think I'll get you out here at the time frame. I really appreciate it. Uh, I wasn't going to ask you an XFL question because we're not just an XFL podcast, but obviously you're talking four downs and stuff this week. I am curious. I just got the email today, Genius Sports, right? The preseason, uh, you know, fantasy, gambling, all that. Did you find that what you could do with Genius Sports and, and working with them, bringing them in as a partner, did that outweigh equal or outweigh anything that you guys thought maybe you could do with the XFL? I was always curious if that was like one replaced the other. No, you know, it, look, we were always we always had a uh, we were always hard at work on a on a strategy. You know, let's call it a made in Canada strategy for the CFL. You know, you don't go into anything with a. Uh, you know, with, uh, you know, all of your eggs in one basket. It just so happened that, uh, you know, co coincidental to the discontinuance of the discussions with the XFL and they're fine people, uh, Dwayne Johnson, Danny Garcia, the team at Redbird, they're fine people. And we had really constructive conversations, but we had a phenomenal plan for the CFL's future. And it just so happened that uh, the timing worked out the genius partnership came together and it's really taken our, our foundation to a new level. So, you know what, again, uh, you know, one didn't, one didn't beget the other. Um, the, the CFL made in Canada strategy was always uh, part of the fabric of our, of our thought process. And it just so happened it worked out beautifully. And it is an amazing partnership that we believe is going to take us to new heights of success. All right, last question for you. I hope this is this is my thing. So uh, I know you're big into the CFL Global you know, initiative, right? 2.0, all that, you know, expanding out. I have long championed our team, uh, the BC Lions as America's CFL team, right? Trying to bring the uh, trying to bring the support down to the states that way. Do you support my initiative in uh, branding the BC Lions as America's CFL team? Well, I, I'm not sure from the commissioner's chair. I, I just want to say from the commissioner's chair, I'm not sure that I should ordain one of our teams as being uh, belonging to an entire marketplace. But listen, uh, Reed, if it makes you happy, and, and frankly, if it makes Amar Doman happy, and if it makes Rick Lawlisher happy, if it makes Rick Campbell happy, but most importantly, if it makes BC Lions fans, regardless of whether they are a north of the 49th parallel or south of it, if it makes them happy, read, if it makes them happy, then it makes me happy. Uh, there you go, right from the uh, horse's mouth, as you will. Uh, Commissioner Ambrosi, could not thank you enough for your time today. Really excited for the season. We're going to be doing you know, pregame shows all, all season, and you know, obviously coming up here to Regina uh, in the to, end of November. So really excited. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, have a great day, and um, I look forward to talking with you again.
Well, I appreciate we have Brandon Anderson on today. XML Nisa, this is the first time that we are talking on the podcast. Obviously, we are in the group chats, but now you're hopping on last minute today, breaking down all the XFL stuff. How are you doing? Good. How about you? I'm good. We're, this is exciting. We have our big, uh, you know, first and foremost, you are on the same episode as the CFL commissioner, Randy Ambrosi. So this is going to be a very exciting time. Uh, we have a bunch of news. Evan Wilsmore is coming on as well. People will know Evan. So we're going to do, you know, some of this stuff with Brandon, some of it with Evan. So we should, we'll try not to double dip too much, but I will obviously want to get your thoughts on everything. First off, the biggest news to me, more than like as certain as it could be, XFL cities basically confirmed via the XFL shop. Uh, Mark uh, posted this article yesterday, was sent over from a listener. Uh, what did you make of the XFL shop, like hidden team section with the cities kind of listed out? Well, I thought it was it was quite interesting. It seems like that actually happened originally with the XFL logos or rebranding um, that it leaked. Not surprised here. Um, I've been trying to keep an eye on the website as well for the same stuff. So someone obviously beat me to it, but um, not surprised. I am glad to see that the city's leaked or the ones we've heard for so long from uh, Mike Mitchell originally that were, I think March timeframe. Um, so I I'm impressed. I am glad that we're starting to see more of the pieces come together for the cities and the league essentially right before they formally announce it, which I assume is pretty soon. It has to be soon. I'm wondering if they're trying to time it with the USFL. I mean that like this week we had the black Adam trailer come out for the rock, like uh Redbirds are like, I guess seven bucks productions kind of weird that way. Danny and the rock, like we don't have too many of one thing at the same time. So if there's like a Terramana announcement, like we try to separate that out from like a Zoa thing or an XFL thing. So, you know, obviously this week with the black Adam trailer coming out, I think people were pretty certain that the teams weren't coming out this week. It is interesting interesting to me. So for people, and they got taken down from the shop, XFL, they had kind of an animated GIF rotating through with a bunch mm-hmm. of the city names. I'm looking at it. So it says like Orlando, San Antonio, DC, Seattle, St. Louis, Orlando, San Antonio. So it repeats. And then the other shirt uh, says Las Vegas. That's kind of hidden. And then the other one says Houston. So when you piece those seven cities together with Dallas that we've already has been officially announced as the headquarters. Those are the eight teams that goes very much in line with Mike Mitchell's reporting. Like Brandon said, um, I haven't gotten your thoughts, Brandon on the podcast. What do you make of those eight cities and like pulling out of New York and LA? Pulling out in New York and LA, I think was a kind of thing that was almost rumored back in 2020. When I was watching the XFL in 2020, it was a very, sparse crowd um i mean you were at metlife which is a nfl stadium it was freezing cold um one of the games i think got below zero um from what i remember and it just did not look like a good time la it i mean they had some nfl players show up to some of those games i remember but there was just no fan base really there either so i think moving Essentially, as we know, Las Vegas and San Antonio as being two of the markets, I think that's a huge thing. I mean, the AAF had San Antonio. It was nonstop. I don't know if they ever officially sold out a crowd, but they were getting up there just like St. Louis did with the Battle Hawks. And then Las Vegas is, to me, I, it is the most exciting out of all this. I grew up an XFL fan. Um, back in 2001, I had family that lived in Las Vegas. It's kind of my second home. Um, so I'm really happy to see them back there. I'm just curious of where they're playing because it, it, the, the Raiders stadium is massive. So that would kind of confuse me. And then, of course, they have, I think it's Sam Boyd still. But that is so far away from the strip that... It makes you question. Plus, Vegas heat in mid springtime is not fun. I'm really confused about where they're going to put there. I mean, Allegiant is is an enormous field or stadium. What's nice about Vegas, you know, like Dallas, these hub cities. I mean, obviously, we live in Seattle, but it's so easy to kind of travel in and out of Vegas anywhere on the West Coast. So, like, if you're in LA, you still want to support. Like, it's so easy to get. I mean, you can be from Burbank Airport to the Las Vegas Strip in like 55 minutes. I mean, mm-hmm. it's really not a big. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a good way to maintain that West Coast presence, but also encouraging, you know, 
if you live in you know North Dakota or whatever, maybe you want to go. Uh, the interesting thing about these shirts that were revealed, and it's it's basically like the XFL split, you know, the two sides, and then it's all the the city names. If we're getting just the the cities announced here, like we did back with the XFL 2020, and then we're going to have to wait later the summer or into the fall for the actual team names, the other you know, nicknames, that is going to be interesting to me because that does seem like splitting what could be one announcement and spreading it out as far as we could. Yeah, and, and that's what I was kind of figuring as well with that is if we go off that 2020 timeline, it seems about the exact same and... I mean, that's what they did with 2020. They released those shirts that had the city names, and then we sat back and waited. Um, exactly. Yep. <laughs> so it's just one of those things where we heard the whole rumor about the June 1st thing that came and went. We didn't get those, but we have heard in that that cities and logos are part of that. So now it is a good question with the cities page on the XFL shop. Are we now... Did they push it back for any reason? And it, there's a lot of questions that kind of remain with that of why they may have did that, or if they're not a hundred percent on these names yet um, with logos and trademarks and things like that. I think something had to have get, gotten caught up here, right? So last in 2020, and again, I hate going back to this timeline. We even saw, was it you that had posted in the group chat that one of the players that got in the player selection pool, like they're just assuming for a fall draft because that's what they did the first time. I mean, it does seem like we're, we're really trying to recreate this playbook, but if, you know, at, at some point we are running out of time here. So if we figure out city names in August, right? Mark Perry has said, yeah, before the NFL season, people go back to school, right? You buy merchandise that way. Uh, I, the June 1st, like maybe something happened. Like I, I don't, the, the whole Randy crack hour thing, like maybe June 1st was going to happen. I've seen people say that they had issues with the San Antonio lease. Maybe one of the cities, they couldn't get closed up in time. And this has delayed it because, you know, doing it here in a week or two. And then I, like, I don't know any rhyme or reason then, except you're trying to compete against the USFL, which I, maybe they'll do by, by lucky chance. But I don't know if that is like, if they're solely focused on like, well, we got to disrupt the USFL playoffs. And that's a, that's what I was thinking too. The other aspect too, is obviously the lingering issue with a together or however you pronounce it, the lawsuit that's going on. I do find it just odd that that lawsuit announcement came the same day, or I think it was around the same day as June 1st. So I'm wondering if they were ready to go. And then they got word maybe the like over Memorial day weekend that that lawsuit was moving forward and whatever they had planned essentially could have caused that stoppage that hold on a second. We actually may have to rebrand again, which I'm hoping not, but we don't know. Oh, that's actually a good point because I don't, and we have Darren on the show here coming up talking about the lawsuit. You know, Darren's a lawyer that, that studies a lot of this stuff. Like, whether or not the lawsuit has merit, it still is in the news, right? It's still something people are talking about. And like I've said, where seven bucks is such a solely minded, like this is our talking point this week. This is our talking point. Yeah. Maybe they just said, we'll call an audible. We'll push it back a week or two. Like, even if we're not worried about this, we just don't want to have like the newly sued XFL release their city names. And like, that would just be into everything. We're like, let's sweep this under the rug. Let's move on from this. And then we'll do, I think that's a good point. Yeah, and, and the fact that uh, obviously we know they went back and re-uploaded the video without the together in the thing, but it is it does make me curious that they are releasing shirts with the logo split with the names in the middle after this is kind of what I, I in my opinion the brand was talking about with suing them is like, hey, that whole split thing and the name in the middle is kind of what we do. So it's it's very interesting to see that they're actually releasing shirts with that. It's a great point. Not to spoiler too much of Darren's interview here, but like, uh, cause a lot of it is predicated there. The togethers 
lawsuit is like you said the the together being separated with that and then the x standing on its own and darren said you know well it depends like are we using the xfl's logo separately or together right it's always going to be with that well yeah if we're releasing shirts with that are we releasing more merch like i know andrew murray has one of the sweatshirts where it's like the x whatever down the arm it's not the full x but it's like the diet you know what do you call it the half the x like mm -hmm. the, the i think i have a long sleeve like that that i purchased and it, it, yeah, exactly. It's one sleeve is down arrow, and I think the other side is the up arrow, or however you want to say that of the X. So it's interesting. I, I don't know if that had to do with it, but it kind of <laughs> the timing is just about right with that. So it, it may be just one of these things where, hey, we're calling an audible, and then they're like, hey, let's take opportunity of the USFL playoffs coming up and just start dumping everything because they did that at the first part of the usfl i think that was when the coaches were announced was the week going into week one yeah well no this is very true so the coaches you're absolutely correct the coaches were announced on espn i think it was the wednesday before the kickoff because we were in nashville heading down to birmingham but also when the usfl was getting ready for uh, i think it was when they were doing the draft they were doing something else but that was when the xfl came out and announced their nfl partnership and i know from talking with people with the usfl they told me like we absolutely take this as a shot to us that they decided to do this. I can't remember what it was like us about had like an announcement on a Thursday, Friday, and then they had something else or it was between the draft and the supplemental draft or it was something, but, but they, that was told to me was we absolutely believe that they timed this to counteract what we had going on, which is interesting. I mean, that's, that's their right one way or another. I, I, I I don't know. I think you XFL cities finally being confirmed would be a bigger news story than week, you know, week one of the playoffs. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I think the, the biggest thing is too, is I think the gloves came off when, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if it was an exec at Fox or whoever it was mentioned that the XFL was competition next year. So and I, I think that's where probably the XFL is like, okay, fine. We'll, we'll step back and we'll take this. And if you're just going to get all of our news dump. And I, I think it was Mike Mitchell or someone was saying, on Twitter that your normal football fans or whatnot like pe shiny pennies and the shiniest penny at that point in time was the XFL, not the USFL who was going into this hub city. And obviously we all know how that, that first week ended with delays. I was there in person in Alabama. So I, I know exactly the rain delays, the game getting moved the Monday night. So it's, there's a lot the XFL I think took from that. And then I think, I think we all learned also they ran an emergency meeting that Monday night as the Maulers game went on that they were like, all right, we need to step back here and start really diving into making sure that our teams are in their, their cities. I think that's where that came from. Uh, I'm paying attention to you. I want to say, you know, Max, uh, Max, listener, Max here, sent us over breaking news here. We're going to talk about, it. we'll get your reaction to it. So Neil Stratton, he's with the uh, inside the, the league, right? He's they're involved in the XFL scouting process. They have a, he has an interview up. They talked with Doug Whaley. This was sent over. This is in succeed in football.com. This was just sent over to me, uh, posted today talking with them and Doug Whaley has confirmed that the XFL draft is going to be in November of 2022. Okay. Interesting. So it kind of, it goes back to what you were saying earlier with the, the player. And I, I, I'm sorry. I don't remember the name off the top of my head of who it was, yeah. but he had posted about it and I, I instantly messaged him or DM would him and was like, Hey, did you guys hear something? no one else did that were the players told at the showcase. And he, as he said, it was just going off that 2020 timeline. Um, but if now that's the case, this is still almost that same timeline. Yeah, so it, it, it makes it, it now makes it question if the team logos and stuff is going to be, I think it was no October, November ish of 2019. 
Well, they they had the the cities were leaked in December. I think they announced them in January, and then we had the the dragons and all that came out in August. I just remember because I'm a wedding videographer, so like my point in life of where I'm at in any point in the calendar year is kind of dictated that way. Because it was uh, like the summer equinox day. It was like the 23rd or something of August. We had the uh, they're saying here. So Exville draft in November. They're going to have a supplemental draft in draft or draft in December and January as more players become available. This is in response to uh, you know the showcases being sold out, the XFL showcases here, the six they have coming up. Uh, Doug says they have not planned any additional showcases. However, we'll allow our personnel, staff, and coaches to evaluate players in their cities of residence in accordance with league policy. So like... Yeah, you know, maybe uh, Carlos or one of the scouting guys, like you could call him up and have him come to a practice wherever he lives. But interesting. So in November uh, draft for the XFL that uh, it was October before. Does that feel late? Does that feel like enough time? Um, if we're looking at time wise, I, I, I almost want to say that may, it may be a month late. Um, I know we know for a fact that training camp starts in Oct or uh, January um, based on the XFL's timeline that they gave us in that um, original leak kind of they did with the picture in the conference room with Danny Garcia and Dwayne Johnson, and the rest of the XFL staff a while back. Um, it, it's, it may be cutting it close, but not as close as the USFL has. I, I think they kind of bit the bullet on that one. Um, I think that's always going to be a problem with spring football is the lack of there's no preseason in most all leagues uh, or preseason games. So I think that could be an issue um, because that only gives, if you're you draft November, you have like spring training type stuff starting in January. It, it doesn't give that much time for players to really get to know each other. And we almost kind of, go back to what the USFL issue was where the first couple of weeks was a lack was kind of them building off each other. Um, and I, I mean, we saw that in 2020 with the XFL as well, where first couple of weeks was kind of, eh, and then week four and five really hit it. And then of course it ended. Well, the issue too is with the XFL before, they were able to kind of like let their players go home in between where this, maybe if they do the November, uh, draft like then you just keep everybody in at that point and get ready for training camps like you know you get a week or two off to go home and do whatever but the XFL like really did the draft in October like we saw Brandon Silvers we did the signings and all of that and then they came back in like December and did the mini camps that way uh, any other thoughts on the cities I want to get your thoughts on the uh, you know offensive coordinators and all of that here before we let you go um I nothing more on the cities I think I I'm glad to see obviously some of the main cities are back from um 2020 obviously we knew about orlando that was actually rumored in like week three of the xfl that hey next year they're probably moving to orlando due to attendance same issue there um but yeah I, I, other than that i don't think there's any much anything else much on the uh teams or cities uh, it's just exciting. I mean, again, this is just further confirmation, kind of Mike Mitchell's reporting and all of that. Uh, the other big news we had, and this is official, right? So the, the team stuff, that's all, or the cities, that's all leaked, whatever. XFL officially announced key football hires and coaching staff for its eight teams. We won't run down all of the names. You know, if you want to go to XFL.com, Mark has a big write up on XFL News Hub. These are all official. We've announced the DPPs. The offensive coordinators and defensive coordinators for all eight teams. Uh, again, we still don't have you know cities associated with these coaches, right? Like we have Anthony Beck's team, we have Jim Hazlitt's team, we have Bob Stoops' team. Uh, any uh, notable names that you have joined in this list, and then I have some thoughts. I think the big one out of this list is Greg Williams um, for offensive or defensive coordinator uh, for Reggie Barlow. I think that's a huge name that the league secured um, that may go under <laughs> kind of under the radar. I, I caught it when I was reviewing this list. I'm like, wait, is that the Greg Williams? I know it is. And sure enough, um, I obviously we know J June Jones leaked <laughs> on his Twitter. He was going to be part of uh, Jim Haslett's uh, coaching staff. I think that's huge. Um, 
June Jones, obviously, I think deserved more than what he got. He was a great head coach. And then the two big names, obviously, are um, Bob Stoops, uh, offensive and def- defensive coordinators, or Jonathan Jonathan Hayes and uh, his brother Jay Hayes. Like they did solid work in St. Louis, so I'm thrilled to see them back. But I'm just thrilled to see that there's a lot of names coming back from 2020 because felt the coaching staff was pretty great going into the 2020 season. Yeah. You know, uh, we have Greg Williams, right? He's the, wasn't he the one that like blitzed the jets or blitz the Raiders, right? And that's how the jets were able to win. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he got immediately dismissed. That. that was like the most incredible thing in football I've ever seen that they're like, yeah. we just can't <laughs> let, uh, you know, them throw, you know, 80 yards or whatever. And it's like an all out blitz there. Uh the Hayes brothers are good. Uh, what's great is, like you said, a lot of these guys are coming back, right? Yeah, the Jonathan Hayes. It's still uh, Jamie Elizondo, right? He was the OC in um, Tampa before. Kind of had a disastrous run in Edmonton mm-hmm. last year for the CFL. But that's why, like, when people, we, you know, we podcast more than just the XFL, right? People listening to the show today, that's the name of the, the title of the episode, right? Not just an XFL podcast. This is like interesting things because these guys go all around. You know, Jamie spent a year, got mud on his face in Edmonton, comes back down now. Like, he is a great offensive mind. I'm looking for him to have a big bounce back, right? He's also like good support staff for Heinz Ward. You know, you have some of these first year coaches coaches that aren't used to, you know, being the head coach. We don't want to have like a Kirby Wilson like scenario mm, in the yep. USFL, right? Like let's surround these guys. Randy Mueller coming back. That's one that Mike had reported on our podcast last week when he was on at Seattle. We're assuming Seattle. That's a really stacked team with Jim Haslett, Randy Mueller, June Jones. Do you know Ron Zook? I don't know if I know Ron Zook. I don't. The name doesn't sound familiar. I was going to start doing some research on these guys at, uh, later today for another podcast I host on YouTube or whatnot, but yeah, his name didn't sound familiar. Um, Some of the names on here don't to me, but I am curious of why Rod Woodson's team is the only one that has not hired an offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator. It's kind of weird when everyone else is announced. Well, and also, you know, not that there's a a run on these coordinators there, but I mean, there's only so much talent. Now you have USFL, you know, sopping up a lot of these guys, XFL. Yeah. Ron Zook, extensive college career at university of Florida. He was at university of Illinois. Uh, I mean, has been coaching since, uh, Murray state back in 1978. So long accomplished guy there, 68 years old, went to Miami of Ohio. Is that right? Am I, I don't know. What yeah. I policy. think that's correct. Special, special teams assistant for the Packers, uh, was with the Salt Lake stallion. So yeah, I mean, you, we've got good, uh, I, I know Evan's going to have some more thoughts about some of these coordinators. Um, the, the Hayes, are you? I know a lot of people were upset that to, you, know, you have Jonathan Hayes back, we have June Jones back, but we don't have them in head coaching positions. Yeah, I'm a little. It, it's kind of weird that Jonathan Hayes didn't get a head coaching position, and, and it's funny too because not to kind of switch back to the USFL, but I mean, it was just yesterday or day before yesterday on USFL News Hub that there was an article about firing Kirby uh, Wilson and Jonathan Hayes. <laughs> the main person on the list. And I even was writing up a thing for the Maulers and had him on the list. And I'm like, Oh, well take him off. Now he's gone. So it, it is interesting that he is back as an offensive coordinator, but maybe that was more his decision that maybe he didn't like head coaching that much as maybe we thought. Well, he was right. Like he was going to go to like uh, Notre Dame, or it wasn't Notre Dame, but it was he was going to go to like a big time school, like a really prestigious college to coach there, and they didn't get the job. Yeah, maybe he's just better off doing that. Uh, someone I'm sure is correct to me. It is weird the Ron Woodson thing doesn't have that uh, has the DPP there. Uh, I think it's good. You know, the USFL they have. Um, uh, Jim Cap, right, kind of in charge. Did I say that right, right? Uh, the, mm-hmm. He's kind of the DPP of the whole, or Jim Pope, sorry, Jim Pop. There we go, Jim Pop. I sorry, it's been a long <laughs> day podcast. He is like the USFL's DPP for like all the teams, right? Like he's kind of acting as that, and it's easy because we're in the hub that way, right? Like you can do all that. I think it's important that you have eight different DPPs associated with the eight teams. I think that's going to help give a little bit more personality to that. Uh, I was talking with uh, Greg. Mescal today. He's does the fan control football play by play. 
you know, there's a lots made with the USFL and like all the teams having parity, right? Okay. Every single game has gone down to the last, you know, possession, even though some of the teams are one and seven and some of them are seven and one, but all the games have been competitive, but there is something to be said for like each team having their own identity and kind of like, you know, some teams boy through others, some teams following whatever. And I think having eight, you know, DPs with the eight teams is going to help kind of it, it further ensure that each of those teams kind of has their own identity that way than versus like the, the draft by committee or whatever that the USFL might be a little bit more with. Yeah, I agree with that. Cause it, that's one thing we do see in the USFL is it, it it's very close. Um, and it seems like when some of you, sometimes you watch the games, it's almost like you're watching the same teams over and over. Um, the only thought process I will have on Rod Woodson and offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator, why that could have been changed. I'm really wondering if uh, hell mummy was going to be someone's offensive coordinator and maybe it was supposed to be Bob Stoops. And then they move Jonathan and Jay Hayes to Bob Stoops team. And that kind of, cause we all know how mommy had the incident and in, with being arrested or whatnot. And he was very liked in the XFL in 2020. I know he got hurt on the sidelines and I think he ended up retiring or quitting right before week five. Um, but he coached in the spring league last year and won the championship uh, for the linemen. So I'm wondering if that could be the answer to that is why they had to make some changes. And Bob Stoops probably was like, Nope, let me take these guys. I, I actually really like that theory because how, yeah, how much we just arrested. We don't want to have that. Why would you have both Hayes brothers on in the, presumably the Dallas team? Right. I, I really like that. Uh, you know, if, if Bob was going to have how maybe you have Jonathan with Rob Woodson, right? Doing it that way. Uh, you know, you could have put uh, Jonathan back with Anthony and St. Louis, if that's where they're doing it. But I do like that. It is weird that you have both of these brothers, you know, on the same team, uh, you know, I would split out a little bit of the wealth of knowledge at that point. Let's get all the teams bolstered up. Uh, I, you know, here I am just talking about not having too much parody in the league, but <laughs> yeah, maybe the hell mummy thing, uh, Brandon, anything else from you, uh, before we get you out of here today, any other, either on the cities, the, the hires, anything else? Nope. I think we are good to go. I appreciate, uh, the offer and coming on here and look forward to potentially coming back. Of course, I always appreciate the XML guys coming on here last night. You know, we get the breaking news today. It's like, who's got time today to come on? Really appreciate people, you know, stepping up, taking the time. Brandon writes for all the new subs. Are you excited for the CFL season? I, you know, I, last year was my first year watching the CFL and it was because of the show here that I got in the CFL. Um, I was kind of, I kind of lost interest quick and I've heard that from a lot of people from last season, but Again, COVID or whatever you want to pandemic stuff with uh, CFL. Um, so I think this year I'm very excited. I can't wait for kickoff tonight and look forward to trying to get back into really paying attention. I'm glad that it, most all games are going to be aired in, a, uh, in the U.S. Yeah, I really lost steam too last year. If I hadn't been podcasting about it, Excuse me, I'm like, I got a lump in my throat. Really hard. Like, it was really hard near the end of the season. I think it's going to be good. They've had the training camps. Even with all the strike stuff, they never really stopped doing the on field stuff. I mean, they had a couple days, I think, where certain teams didn't go on, depending on the province. But I, I think they're going to be in good form. People seem happy with the hash marks. I'm really excited about that. So, uh, Brandon Anderson here, uh, XFL, CFL, USFL News Hub. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Well, I'm excited today. We have Evan Wilsmore back. We only bring on Evan when we have exciting XFL stuff to talk about. How are you doing, sir? Yeah, I'm doing all right. A bit tired right now, but whenever there's important XFL news to discuss, I'm always going to be here to talk about that. So yeah, let's just dive into it. Uh, I want to know your thoughts. Breaking news. I was just on with Brandon, you know, people listening. This all happens real time. We all uh, XFL to hold their draft in November 2022 with supplemental drafts in December, January as need be. What do you think of a November 2022 draft? Yeah, you know, I think it's a pretty good time. Um, it gives teams enough 
um, space to sort of, you know, create the rosters and, and get to know their players. Um, you know, we talked about the USFL a few times on here about how, you know, their draft was structured and how it was a bit too close to training camp and the start of the season. But um, I think with a November start, you know, if you have the season kick off in February, that's um, – trying to do the math that's a good three months i think you know to prep teams um you know kind of get that uh team bonding in uh per se so yeah i, I really like that timeline um maybe it wouldn't have hurt to do october um i know that the xfl draft in 2019 i think was in october so that was a bit earlier but yeah somewhere around that time frame i, I really like that and i'm glad they're doing it you know not like two or three weeks before um their kickoff not not to you know put any shame on the usfl but um i, I like it uh, yeah, you know, people, so yeah, it was the October before, like the XFL did the draft before and then basically went and took a nap for a couple months and then came back. So like, it, I would rather do November and then we're right into training camps versus October and then taking two months off and then doing the Houston mini, whatever they call it, like right. mini camps. And then they did the training camps. Over. So like, you know, they didn't really get them into pads till like January before. So I, I would have liked the, you know, more time is always is better i don't i what what are you gonna do yeah no i i agree uh so we have the cities come out brandon and i did a deep dive on that you know, we had you on a couple weeks ago when we had the houston smoke and we had the st louis and all that stuff thoughts now having seen the xfl shop kind of basically leak the announcements <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of this we saw coming and, um, you know, our own Mike Mitchell has been teasing these things for months. You know, we've um, we've had pretty accurate city locations for a while now, so nothing was really too much of a surprise. Um, you know, in terms of coaching as well, um, it was confirmed that June Jones is going to be the offensive coordinator under Jim Hazlitt. I was on the show a few weeks or a few months ago now. Um, I guess it was a few weeks talking about that. Um, you know, now that's confirmed. Um, they didn't say it was in Seattle yet, but uh, we can, um, we, we can, I, I think, you know, uh, what's, what's the word here? Um, come to the conclusion that that is what it's going to be. Um, and amongst other things, you know, we talked about Anthony Beck, the St. Louis connection, you know, Wade Phillips in Houston. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think all the, you know, the locations are, are great for the most part. You know, we've, we've touched on that before. Um, I'm a big, you know, fan of the Las Vegas team. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm just excited, you know, and especially with some of the coaching placements too, staying on that topic for a minute, just about, you know, like, for example, you've got A.J. Smith, who's going to be the offensive coordinator under Wade Phillips um, in Houston. And A.J. Smith was with the Roughnecks back in 2020 as the receivers coach. So he gets a bit of a promotion. Big shout out to him. Um, so, yeah, just those kind of little uh, nitpicky things, I guess you'd say, where, you know, coaches are placed. I think that sort of makes the overall city announcements even more exciting because even though they haven't been officially tied yet, we can kind of, you know, understand, you know, where things might be going and where they're coming from. It's so weird to me. Like, it's so backwards that we have, you know, like Anthony Beck's team. It's like Survivor. Like, we have like Anthony Beck's tribe. We have Jim Hazlitt's tribe. Like, we don't know. I just, it's so weird to me. It's just backwards. And I don't know if they were still trying to figure out the stadium stuff. And well, we saw USFL in the bubble and we don't want to do the hub now. We're like, we're, we're frantically changing, even though we've had two years of runway and we've wasted all of it because we were talking to the CFL. But like, it's just weird. I just couldn't imagine. I watched, like, I wasn't in all this, but I watched like the Jim Zorn Seattle presser. And it was like, here's Seattle. We know Seattle. Here's Jim Zorn. He's going to be your coach. It's just so weird to do it. The the other way be like we know jim Hazlitt's a coach but where is he coaching we don't know right yeah uh any other big takeaways i, I know that you would have lots of thoughts you know we and uh anthony and i kind of talked about the hayes brothers with bob stoops odd that they wouldn't split that up you already mentioned aj smith coming back uh you know, obviously we know the june jones and jamie elizondo coming back other thoughts about some of the hires today that we've seen i mean i wouldn't say specifically about um, certain people. A lot of the hires I, I did like. Um, I'm just more interested to see sort of how the staff structure plays out because, you know, some of these pairings we've seen before and some of them are completely new. So what I'm really interested to see is, you know, if the previous XFL people, you know, getting back together, will they have a better understanding of what's going on compared to the newer coaches or because it's a new, I guess, product and it's revamped, you know, is everyone going to be sort of on a fresh slate and is it going to be different, I guess, is what I'm interested to see just based on, you know, where the coaches and coordinators have landed.
Not that uh, I like to have this debate, but this is the debate that's already come up today. You know, do we like these better than the USFL? Right? Is this a better structure? Uh, I, I like having the each team having their own DPP, right? Where the USFL kind of has Jim Pop right now uh, over all of it. Uh, thoughts on that and like each team building its own core identity. Yeah, I mean, if you want to compare USFL and XFL coaches, I personally I think they're pretty similar. Um, I do agree with you on the fact that having um, a DPP for each team is is beneficial. Um, as someone who's really sort of into that uh, general manager type structure um, or just management in general of a team, um, you know that means a lot to me. And I'm glad that the XFL is is doing that, where they're assigning um, DPPs to each. team team as opposed to having like a league wide sort of person. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in terms of just pure coaching talent, again, it's, it's hard to say until you've actually seen what the coaches can do, but you know, the USFL did a decent job with getting some, you know, veteran uh, NFL presence in there. You know, Jeff Fisher is obviously a name that everyone will recognize. And, you know, Kirby Wilson, even if he hasn't had the most success was in the NFL for a while. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the XFL has sort of a mix of guys too. Some people are trying it out for the first time. And some people like Wade Phillips have been doing it for pretty much their entire life. So it's a nice broad uh, spectrum. And I'm really excited to see where that can go. What do you think about matching maybe the people that need a little more help, right? Like we have Bob Stoops, like we know he's a head coach, like, right. you know, like we have him loaded, right? We have Rick Mueller, we have both the Hayes brothers, and then you, know, you have Anthony Becht, right? Like, you know, Dave Bowler, uh, Bruce Gradkowski, right? Gradkowski, right? Like, Gradkowski, are, yeah. are we, are we surrounding like a new head coach with Anthony Becht with enough support or like, did Bob Stoops need the mega powers in Dallas with him? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, do we need to separate that out and not have a Kirby Wilson like experience with the XFL? I mean, to some extent, yeah, you know, I would like to see, uh, um, I guess more diverse coaching networks, but you know, in the business, um, I guess sometimes you're always going to have, um, like minds gravitate towards each other. For example, you know, going back to the XFL in 2020, um, you know, June Jones and AJ Smith were kind of, you know, all about that run and shoot system. And obviously now they're on, they're with different staffs, but they hold the same role as offensive coordinators. So you're kind of just taking that talent that's already there and dividing it up. I, I think it's good to have some connection between coaches, whether it was, you know, maybe they played on the same team before, or maybe they coached on the same staff or did something together. Um, but it is also interesting to see how, you know, different people can work together for the first time. And I think that'll make it more interesting in some scenarios, like the on-field product, because of course you have um, defensive minded coaches, offensive minded coaches. And I, I think what I really liked about these staffs is that there's a nice blend um, again, of both sides of the spectrum um, where you're going to have some really diverse teams. And I think we're going to see some really cool stuff uh, next year. I've been diving into this article. Max sent this over. This had the XFL draft stuff in it. You know, this is Neil Stratton, right, with Inside the League. Uh, this is kind of a Q&A with Doug Whaley on SucceedInFootball.com. A couple of things I want to get your thoughts on. Uh, they had a question here, you know, does a player need to have an agent to be in the XFL? Doug Whaley says no. Uh, you know, obviously that would help, but, you know, the showcases and things. I think that's good. I think the USFL had, uh, you know, you had to be invited in by an agent. They had to get you into the draft. But what do you think about the XFL basically saying you, you are able to play in our league without an agent? Yeah, um, honestly, I think that's a great structure. And, you know, there's probably going to be some guys that say, you know, why, why would you say that? Um, you know, because an agent is supposed to, you know, kind of monitor you, give you some structure, guidance, things like that. Um, but I really think, you know, the XFL has always kind of been a more raw opportunity, right? And if you can get, you know, a player at one of these showcases off the street who, you know, really shows up and, you know, maybe it's someone that, people really haven't heard of before, you know, then that can create a really good story. And again, as a guy, you know, as someone who's always about opportunity, you know, I think that just getting these guys, you know, based off of film and other things and not based on, you know, who represents them, um, just rather who they are as an individual and a player. I, I think that's huge. And I'm glad that the XFL took um, a step in that direction for sure. 
It's interesting. It definitely is this. There, they want to be the league of culture change. You know, you don't. There's a lot of guys that that can ball better than anyone that that just aren't represented the right way. Didn't go to the right college. I mean, that's why they're doing these showcases. You know, diverse areas, right? You have the HBCU showcase. We have the Hawaii showcase. Some of these are invite only, but like trying to find players that have been passed over before really speaks to. I don't like all of the verbose language that's been used by Danny and the rock, kind of the same stuff here for the last year. But at least this is action going to that of these words of like, no, we want to find players and give these guys opportunities. They wouldn't have. Absolutely. You know, and I just think that, I mean, the, the showcases that are invite only, I will say, I think those guys have a better chance and they probably are more proven, but, you know, I do think that all of the showcases are sort of fair game, equal opportunity. You know, you show up, you play well, you'll probably get a contract because from what I understand, you know, this this league, I mean, they're really advertising and it's all about opportunity. I mean, you know, there is a lot of repetition, like you said, between um, Danny and The Rock. And, you know, I, I get that. It's it's marketing. It's, it's going to happen. You know, some stuff is just going to you're going to hear it a lot. But I, I really do believe that, like, having a, a sort of showcase based pool of talent is a lot better than just you know contacting a bunch of agents and saying hey is your guy available not that agents don't do a good job i'm just saying there's a lot of guys who aren't represented by agents that can still play you know as well or maybe even better than people who are more established per se the other question they had on here, they're talking about player evaluation. They, the question is, will player evaluation be centralized? How much latitude will each team, director, or player personnel have? They said uh, the head coaches and the DPP will be making all roster decisions for their respective teams. Uh, obviously, the XFL League is going to receive recommendations and vet them to make sure that they're okay to be in the pool. But placing a lot of that, this is, again, from Doug Whaley in the interview with Neil Strat. Like, uh, again, we have all these hires today, right? The OC. DC, DPP, like knowing that they have full control to kind of shape their rosters, it got to be exciting, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, this is why it's so important to have like a DPP, you know, and a, a specific assignment because roster construction to me is one of the most important parts of the game and it's often overlooked. You know, people see the on field product in whatever league it is, you know, it could be XFL, USFL, CFL, NFL, I mean, you name it. But I think roster construction people overlook they just they're looking on their tv and they see you know a bunch of guys out there running around you know some of them might be better than others but you know if you really do a deep dive into it um you know you can find talent in a lot of places and you know there's a saying that always gets passed around you know if you can play in the nfl or in this case the xfl you know they, they'll come and find you and we're, we're talking about you know a lot of opportunities here so i'm interested to see how you know, the roster construction is done with maybe a more broader pool, especially with the showcases happening, but it gives um, those DPPs and, you know, general managers and things like that, just a lot of, or coaches as well, just a lot of good, you know, experience. And um, I think that's going to be really important moving forward if this league really wants to um, change the landscape per se and, and be different and be unique is, you know, how do you, actually do roster construction in the modern era with so many more players. I think that's the, the big question here, the big ticket per se. Uh, last question for me, for you today, because I, I appreciate you hopping on here, you know, breaking to cover all this stuff. Like, It'll be curious to me how the XFL balances. Okay, we need, we want to find the diamond in the rough, right? Any guy, we want to figure out, you know, the best players. But then also, like, we need some semblance of names to sell this league, right? Like, is the XFL, is Danny and the Rock, like, is that enough to get people to watch? And then we can have not a bunch of no namers, but just not a lot of household names, right? We've really dug and found these guys that have been passed over for two, three, four years. Or, like, are we going to have not, but like, land? Andrew Jones there like are we paying up to get some guys like I'm just curious how they balance that yeah I mean you know you look at the USFL you know they have a lot of XAF and XFL players um, you know I think it'll be a bit different with the um, new version of the XFL um, just because again it all comes back to these showcases you know it's you know where can you find guys and where is your database and information coming from especially if you're not represented by an agent um, I'm just interested to see, you know, sort of the pool that they put together and then more importantly, the on-field product that comes with that, you know, a few months after the draft and signings are made and, and things like that, recommendations, et cetera. 
Uh, well, Evan, I really appreciate you hopping on today. Our big breaking news. Always good to have your opinions on. I like, you know, it's like the XFL, the bat signal comes out. We got news. We get, you know, you and Brandon came on today. I really appreciate you guys making the time. Obviously, we're excited for the CFL season. People can check out your work on all the different news subs here heading into the, uh, the whatever. We just not even an off season anymore. It's just the season. I know. Just year round. Yeah, no, but I, um, I mean, a lot of exciting stuff is coming. You know, I'm, I'm very happy with all these XFL hires, you know, seeing some more familiar faces return and seeing some um, new people come in that I have uh, high expectations for. So, yeah, all around a, a good day for the XFL. I'm, I'm happy to hear all the news. Awesome. Thanks again, Evan. Well, I'm excited today. We have Darren Heitner, uh, you know, trademark IP lawyer with Heitner Legal. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. We tried to get you on during all the USFL stuff. I think your wife was, uh, you know, you guys had a baby. So congrats and welcome to the Markcast. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And yes, we have a baby who's now three months old. Uh, well, great. So we're tracking this. We have the new together. I learned how to pronounce that right. Uh, cease and desist here with Sue Bird and everybody against the, the rock. You had an article here I have above the law. You've been tracking this on Twitter and everything else. So what what are your thoughts on this? I was a bit surprised that they actually went ahead and filed a complaint in federal court. I had seen some time ago that there were social media posts about the concern or the alleged concern that the XFL through its rebranding had created a brand through its marks that were confusingly similar with those of together. And I guess ultimately the belief that it, there's a likelihood of confusion. It's funny. I see you wearing the XFL hat as we're talking here today. So primarily the focus is actually just on that X in the XFL, which is According to the plaintiff in this case together or the, or the company that owns that brand, they believe that the X that the XFL uses is so close to the X that together uses that I suppose it could cause consumers to be confused as to source, confused as to association or affiliation. Is the XFL involved with together? Is together involved with the XFL? And if you're just using that X, let's say, on goods and services that you're providing to the public, does the consumer get confused and think that either that XFL product is coming from Together or vice versa? An interesting wrinkle here is that with Together's filing, it admits, and I verified through my own research, Together has filed trademark applications with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, but none of them have yet been registered. And in fact, there, last I checked, there were some office actions outstanding from the examining attorney who was assigned to those applications. So it's not your prototypical federal trademark infringement lawsuit where you're relying on strong registrations. Here, it's with the potential of them being registered. So I'm not quite clear that Together itself has these rights that they're trying to enforce. Uh, does that what, what does that do then when they're trying to say, hey, you guys, you know, you're infringing on us, yet we don't actually have a real rock solid hold on these rights ourselves? It absolutely weakens the case, first and foremost. It, it takes a claim that would be a lot stronger with a federal registration, although I'd still argue that I'd rather be representing the XFL, even if there were federal registrations in place. But now you're talking about a brand and together that is relying on what's called common law rights, that they were just first to use their mark in commerce and that they still have to prove that there's a likelihood of confusion that will result, that the marks themselves are very closely uh, similar and that the look and feel is almost the same, that they're selling goods and services in similar categories in, of industries, that the consumer is being advertised to, marketed to, promoted to in the same forms and fashion. And one thing that typically I look for in these filings, and it's not required, but one thing I always look for is whether there's any actual confusion that the plaintiff can cite to. Because obviously, if there is, the plaintiff's going to use this opportunity to put it out there, right in the forefront. And in the filing, I saw no such examples, which again, is not dispositive that they have no case but I think, it, again, there's many signs that show weakness, and that's one of them. 
You said you would rather be representing the XFL in this. Why is that? Well, as I said, there's just so many weaknesses that the plaintiff has here. First and foremost being that there aren't registrations attached to their applications. It's also very interesting when I looked at the applications that are pending for together, I noted that these office actions have been pending for almost a full six months. Why haven't they been proactive in responding to them? Yet it was so important to file this lawsuit against the XFL. And that leads me to believe, well, I should note, if Together does not respond to these office actions within six months, those applications will actually be abandoned. But it makes me believe that this is about a lot more than simply trying to prevail on the rights that they believe that they have. I think this is more of a PR publicity campaign. And so I'd rather be in the XFL shoes because even in a world where Together had these rights perfected, if I compare just the X that Together uses to the X that the XFL uses, and by the way, I think by and large, the XFL is not really using the X on its own quite a lot. The, the Together cited to a YouTube video where the X is pulled apart in an, in an XFL video and in between the actual word together is there. And I think that pissed them off. But outside of that, I haven't seen many examples where the XFL is using that X by itself. So I just I don't really get it uh, outside of it being a, a publicity stunt or part of a PR campaign. As somebody who's been practicing for 12 years, a lot of IP-related work, including trademarks, I just think the XFL has a much stronger case. Well, and they've, so I think it was last week, they had pulled down the YouTube video and had re, they re-uploaded it, right? And so they got rid of that together. We have the one saved, the original one, because like it had got leaked when they were trying to come up with all this brand stuff. But uh, so, I mean, they're certainly pay, paying attention to that and at least taking those proactive matters. But like you said, it, it's a freeze frame of, I think it's even animated, like the things coming together. It's not like the logo is existing in and of itself. And I think it's smart for the XFL to take down that video, for instance, because in my world, that's not an admission of guilt in any way in trying to remediate any alleged harm. I mean, it, it's actually doing what Together asked them to do in a sense. I mean, it, as opposed to actually completely rebranding the cease and desist to the extent that it caused the XFL to rethink maybe some of the content that it's published if in fact it could potentially cause some confusion, well, good for the XFL to remove that specific video so as to at least take some action in good faith to try to ameliorate any potential harm that's been alleged. That's interesting because, and not that we want to touch too much on this USFL, but a lot was made. So like, the, like you said, the XFL bringing down the video, the USFL changed a lot of the language they used, right? Once the new lawsuit was brought about, it was no longer like we're bringing back. It was the new USFL. So you're saying that trying to remediate that stuff, that's not necessarily the admission of guilt? Not at all. And there's actually a federal rule on that specific subject. Um, I think it's actually a very good idea and very important for brands to um, be nimble and willing to make modifications after cease and desist letters are delivered, after complaints are filed in state or federal court. Uh, it shows good faith. It shows that they're making efforts without, again, fully admitting to any fault. Um, but, you know, showing that they're willing to play ball to a certain extent. I think together never imagined that its letter or its statement was going to cause the XFL to pull back on its rebranding. Imagine how much resources the XFL has already attributed to it. And the XFL, I'm positive, has its own legal counsel internally that has looked at this quite a bit and probably says we're not concerned because I wouldn't be either. A uh, couple last questions here. You talk about the X and the, and the trademarking of that. They have the outstanding office you know, action. Is that a really hard case to prove like we have this X stylized in a way that makes it unique to us? Well, that's interesting. And that'll be left up to an examining attorney. I don't think that at least from the office action that I've read that it in itself was something that the USPTO, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, believed was not worthy of being registered. What I saw 
in part was a concern that the description of the X that was filed by Together was inadequate, that um, it didn't specifically specify that one portion of the X was shaded, et cetera. And those things are important because they create distinctions. And also the USPTO, while it wants to recognize rights for the owners of marks, it doesn't want to completely destroy creativity in this ecosystem. I mean, it's not going to give the letter X to a company and say, no one else in the country can use the letter X. And that's important here. Uh, because again, if you look side by side, you look at the XFL, you look at together, I think that there are inherently distinctive attributes. And again, I don't think the XFL has or is intending to use the X on its own quite so much. I think in large part, it's going to be the XFL as a whole. And to the extent that it does use the X by itself, I have to imagine it will, it will be used in close proximity to the entire mark XFL, which, by the way, gets rid of any consumer confusion. They cited, and I know that part of this is legal stuff, but like, you know, irreparable damage that cannot be compensated with. You know, we read through, we've, we've done a lot of like case reading on here on the Mark House in the last few months, but like, I, I can't imagine, you know, it's not like this is like a porn company that's trying to use the X. Like, I mean, this is like a, a, a sports brand, right? Owned by Danny Garcia and The Rock. I mean, this is not, do you get what I'm saying? The reason why that type of language is inserted is because Together is not only seeking monetary relief in the form of compensation, it's also seeking what's called an injunction. And in order for the court to enjoin the XFL from using these marks, to prevent it from using the marks that they've created as part of its rebranding process, and likely what's forthcoming if it's not already filed, which is a motion for preliminary injunction, in order to satisfy the elements it has to actually bring forth those things like irreparable harm or that they cannot be adequately compensated simply through monetary means, that um, the public benefit uh, outweighs the harm through an injunction like this. And ultimately, if, if an injunction was awarded, which I can't fathom will be the case, together would also have to post a, a, some sort of bond um, in an amount to be determined. So that's why you see this type of legal language in the document that you've reviewed, just because it's a requirement in order to ultimately seek and potentially receive injunctive relief. Uh, last question for me. You talked about you know the PR-ness of all this. It's odd that you know, they've cited like it's the Rocks XFL and you know, Danny, uh, um, TMZ is talking like, you know, it's Sue Bird versus the Rock, whatever. I mean, Danny Garcia is co-owner of this, you know, the first woman to, you know, own a, a major sports league. It's just odd that it seems like a lot of this is like the Rocks coming in, bullying us. I understand, you know, female empowerment they want with this brand. It just seems weird that they're not targeting the whole picture here, which it seems more like a PR stunt for that. It does. Um, and I remember looking back at the original tweet. I think it was uh, Rapino mm -hmm. who published a tweet basically saying, you know, I forgot. So there's something awkward. funny about The Rock, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, something about The Rock's cooking. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, I thought that's where it would end. Um, I really didn't imagine that a complaint would be filed. But then again, consider that it costs roughly $400 as a filing fee. And I doubt they paid their lawyers all that much money to draft the complaint, if any at all, and consider the amount of attention that they've received as a byproduct. So, um, and it's not, the thing is, it's not frivolous. I don't think a court's going to say it's completely frivolous. So they're not likely to be sanctioned in any way. I would argue that they've received quite a benefit from this all. Maybe. And maybe, maybe also, I mean, there are people who say there's no such thing as bad publicity. So if that's true, then it's, it's worth it. Well, if I, for one, learned about it. So at least they've got one person on the board. Uh, Darren, I really appreciate you taking the time, busy and heading out of town. So I appreciate you sitting down with us today. All right. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited today. We're really, truly covering all the alt football leagues today. We have Greg Meskel on uh, Fangirl Football. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, thanks for having me. 
Uh, I'm excited. So I I feel like this season, and I want to hear from you, certainly from everyone I've talked to has exceeded expectations kind of across the board. I know the writers at XML News Hub have been really high on everything. How have you felt like the season's gone so far? Oh, uh, totally. I, I think on paper, it was already going to be uh, bigger and better than last year, right? We doubled the teams, longer season. Uh, you got some new people involved. So right out of the gate, there were, there were already some pretty big expectations. And then you've seen it week after week. Uh, viewership has been great. Fan interaction has been great. Uh, we have been able to have people actually in the venue. That was that was a big change from a year ago uh, with COVID where no one could actually be inside to watch the game. So to have all that blended together, uh, I think it has exceeded everyone's expectations. And uh, you know well, right, the challenges uh, in all these football leagues to try and get to season two and to be successful. And uh, it's been so exciting to see FCF be able to do that well. Uh, I mean, you guys really are crazy sometimes. Like I, you know, we we're getting ready for the season kickoff and like everyone was talking USFL and like, okay, they haven't even announced the coaches. And I see Patrick tweeting, like, we're building our own arena. Like we're getting ready to go. I mean, but it's like you guys exist in your own world, which is, is great, I think. And it just, you just kind of do what you do and set your timelines. And as far as I can tell, have accomplished all of that. Yeah. And, it, you know, for me, uh, there there are other leagues obviously out there, uh, USFL, right? XFL coming in, NFL, of course. To me, yes, it's all football, but the FCF isn't isn't really a direct competitor to that stuff as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you, you have fans that call the plays in this league. That really sets it apart. That kind of fan governance, that's not what's going on in all these other football leagues. And um, so, you know, I, obviously hopefully there's room for everyone, but also uh, the FCF, I think kind of stands alone in that, in that regard, to your point, they really are uh, blazing their own path, right? Building a custom venue that really is focused on the viewer experience. Yes. There's fans uh, in the stands, but it really is about what, what the person uh, at home is seeing and how they're interacting, not only visually, but then also, uh, it's so important that people play as well, right? Whether they're doing it uh, through through Twitch or on the app. And so when you kind of blend those two things together, it's uh, really hard to think of someone else that's doing exactly that same thing. Yeah, so obviously last year, bringing in tons of technological stuff, the voting, everything, uh, you know, I played along a lot. It seemed like it went well, right? All things, I mean, considering everything, sure. like, I don't really know that there was any real major snafus with that. How has it gone uh, going into year two, smoothing all of that out? I, I think it gets better uh, all the time. And as you know, the founders will, will always say, right, this is like a work in progress, right? They're developing technology as they go. So if you think about other kind of tech startup sort of things right there, there are version one, version two, right? There's a reason why they call it season 2.0, right? Not just season two, because it is kind of uh, a nod to kind of that, that tech development end of things. I think what I've noticed is uh, things have gone faster this year. It feels like the play call comes in quicker and gets down to the field and gets enacted faster. Um, you've seen the playbook expand. Uh, a big shout out to coach uh, Sean Latta, who really opened up that playbook. Uh, and, and just little things that, you had to kind of do it to understand how you had to tweak it, right? So previously, for example, uh, the play calls had one name that the fans saw, right? And there were some fun names and some jokes and that sort of thing, but that was not how the players referred to the plays. And so you had kind of a disconnect, right? A player might say, hey, I love this. And a, and a fan's like, I don't know what that play is. I, I always call this. They've merged those things. So, so now what you call on the app is what the players actually know that play to be. And I think that's been a great way to kind of even tie those two groups, the fans and the players, which are so well connected in this league, you've been able to bring them even closer together. You talked before, you know, where you guys exist and it is, it's a weird space because it's the, the fan engagement. It's, you know, we have the NFTs now, which I have, you know, people get all weird about all that stuff. Like uh, you have the, uh, the online video gaming, but like you're still competing, right. With, with talent, right. That could be going to like arena ball, could be going to uh, USFL or, sure. you know, over the elf. Uh, and also like, you know, the time of year, I love the last year, February timeline that it's been really hard this year with the other, you know, spring stuff going on but so so you exist on your own but you still exist in this world right and so how do you guys do you do you even pay attention to any of that other stuff because it, it for right or wrong it seems like you guys do not and you just exist as you are i you know you probably have to ask each person i'm sure some people are a bit more in tune to that uh, than others i'm certainly aware of all the other football that's going on out there but 
Um, I don't personally, I don't, I don't look at it like an us against them at all. You know, if, if the USFL does well, that's fine by me or XFL or whatever else, because I think this is such a unique thing on its own that it's, it's not going to be reliant on the, on the ups and downs of someone else, right? To your point, sure. There's talent, right? If, if there's not another option, then, you know, maybe there are some guys that come and play in FCF instead of going somewhere else. But it, there are also a lot of football players out there, right. That really want an opportunity. That's been part of the fun of this league too, is, is that while there have been a lot of the known names, we've seen so many people that uh, maybe you never heard of before, or you hadn't heard of in quite a few years. And we've been able to kind of tell their story and kind of share their journey. Um, and, and so that's kind of, you know, not to, uh, be oblivious to what's going on everywhere else. But, but I think like anything, if you're going to do it well, you kind of got to live in this and just focus on this. And, you know, you know, from my standpoint, I know the guys that, that work on the broadcast, we just kind of try and do this as, you know, as good as we possibly can and, and hope that that's what everyone will enjoy and, and kind of share, share the story here of FCF. Uh, it's been uh, gameplay has been good this year. High scoring games, right? I mean, a lot of I see like the, even the post of the games I don't watch, you know, like fifty points. Right? Like, what have you thought so far of the quality of play? You know, elevating from season because it's so hard. Because right, you're always going to have turnover, and especially where you guys are with the roster switching around. But it seems like yeah, the high scoringness is maintained, right? Uh, you know, to an extent, it was interesting last season. It seemed like literally every game came down to the final play. <laughs> now just a numbers thing as the season expands and you have more games, you're, you're not going to be able to have everything hang in the balance in the final minute. So I think that's been a bit of a change. And then also the rosters by and large locked after week three. So all the skill positions kind of stayed where they were. Uh, the offensive line defensive uh, packages did switch week to week. But so one of the interesting things that I think developed this year was you saw in a longer season and with rosters kind of lock a bit, some more continuity built on those rosters where quarterbacks knew who they were working with. They kind of got into a rhythm with certain receivers and super backs and that sort of thing. And then you saw those package groups really start to kind of meld together. So it started to take on, I think what, what you'd see naturally in a league, right? There were going to be some weeks where there would be teams that were just decidedly better than another team. There were going to be some close games. And I, I don't know, in a way to me, that felt more real, right? That's that, that's kind of the ebb and flow of what happens in any professional league teams start to separate themselves. And, uh, and then as we saw late in the season, uh, the way the FCF is built, you, you do have an opportunity to make a run. You're never quite out of a game, which is, which is one of the fun wrinkles in this league. No, I think locking part of the rosters is really important. I, I, that was a lot of the frustration I saw is, is it's fun and we enjoy doing the draft, but at some point, you have to balance the fan aspect of it. And also like, we need to feel the football team here. And I think that that's a good balance. You guys have hit that way. Well, and I, I think people and, and uh, credit again, the folks throughout the league are so fan um, informed, right? If, if the fans kind of have a lot of feedback on something, they're happy to take that and, and kind of implement it going forward. And I think that was one of the pieces of feedback after season one, Hey, I love being able to pick my team. Now I want to play with that team. You know, if you, if you kind of blend the fantasy model or, you know, you're doing season mode and something like that, right. You, you like your roster. Now you want to try and work with it. And so that was something that we didn't really get as much last season. And now you've seen it. I think too, to your point, as guys have been able to work together more, they're only naturally going to get better. So you saw people actually run the plays uh, better, kind of have a better understanding of, of what each other likes to do on the field. And then that just makes for a better product in the long run. Uh, standout players that you've seen uh, so far this year. I mean, you're the you know, lead play-by-play and obviously have a wealth of sports knowledge. What have you thought about like certain guys that have really stood out in the field? It's It's been a mix of guys that were returners from last year and then some new faces. Uh, I, I think you'll hear a lot of people talk about DeAndre Francois, the quarterback for uh, the Board 8 Football Club. He's certainly in that in that conversation as the best player in this league, even though he missed a game and a half, but uh, just has kind of the complete package that works well in the FCF and just has that uh, kind of veteran experience. So kind of never rattled by the moment uh, defensively uh, Cecil cherry, another guy who's, who's ended up on the board eight, but uh, had to kind of bounce around with these defensive units uh, just has delivered some jarring hits has so many tackles this year. Um, and you see the benefit of guys that played a year ago and are now back. I, I even think of guys like a James Harden or a Jordan Smith or um a uh, Yeti Lewis, they didn't have massive seasons a year ago, 
But I think the the understanding of how the whole thing works gave them a leg up coming into season two, and they've just been able to play really, really well. And then new guys, uh, Bryson Aline, super back out of out of the state of Delaware. He played really, really well this year. Uh, we saw a couple of other tight ends. As the playbook expanded, the tight ends really got an opportunity to thrive. You know, in that seven on seven. Uh, I think what everyone quickly realized was there are going to be some inherent mismatches here for tight ends as they get out in space. If we can start targeting them more, they're going to get a chance. And so we've seen a a whole host of tight ends, uh, Joshua Johnson, a local guy from Georgia. Again, a guy probably no one had ever really heard of largely getting a chance and, you know, and starting to excel. So that's been a lot of fun. And, you know, I could give you 25 other names, but those are, those are a sprinkling of some. Uh, I want to hear your reaction to uh, my former quarterback with the XFL Seattle Dragons, Brandon Silver, is coming in and absolutely getting lit, <laughs> lit up. That was a wild day. Uh, I obviously had been like many excited. Okay, this guy's joining the FCF. He, you know, he's another established quarterback. You saw the stats he put up, right? He, I mean, w- well traveled, but had been at uh, kind of on the cusp, right, of of that highest level of football, uh, and it was. Kind of like that old, uh, that like Simpsons meme where like Grandpa Simpson walks into the bar, like puts his hat down, picks it back up, and walks right back out the door. Uh, he, he he was in for what a couple of plays, and then got absolutely rocked by Cecil Cherry and never returned. And uh, Devin Gardner, who does the games with us uh, on Saturdays, the former Michigan quarterback, he saw that hit and he was like, "Yeah, he like he's leaving. That's it. Like this is this is not what anyone thought they were signing up for." Uh, that that was a a jarring hit by Cherry. Well, but I think that that's good because I think you know you guys play with a chip on your shoulder a little bit. I think it's good. Let's bring in the guy, get him a little roughed up. Like we can, we know how to play too. I mean, I think that that was it was a good look. I think overall. <laughs> well, <laughs> because you did, you know, and obviously our games air live on Twitch in addition to some other great great broadcast partners. But on Twitch, you know, as you know, right, you're getting the instant stream of feedback, and it's funny every now and again someone will suggest that this is uh, like flag football or, you know, or something that's not as serious as it is. And then you think back to those plays and it's like, I assure you, this is very serious. Like these guys, you, you do not try and tell the people that are playing in this league that it doesn't count, that it's not professional football. That, that's one of the interesting things. Uh, we just had a, a championship preview show uh, last night talking to Terrence Williams, former Cowboys receiver, you know, played, played at the highest level for many years. And one of the things I always like to ask those guys, not so much for myself, but to better inform the fans is when did you understand this was real? Like, when did you get into this and have a sense of they're playing for keeps here? And like so many guys, he said on day one, like, it's not, you know, it's not a thing that anyone's taking lightly here. And that's not to make it out more than it is, but, but it is to just inform people that everyone that's here is, is here with purpose and not just like a flag football league in the park. Uh, so heading into this weekend, no, I like that. I like that because it looks, you know, it, I, I get that. I get having the chip and wanting the players to know, like, we're taking this seriously. Heading into the weekend, I have my board Apes jersey on, you know, picked from the season. I had the Wild Aces last year, right? I know that we, I don't know if we talk about them or not anymore, but I had the Wild Aces. They won. Board Apes going up against the Zappers. I know that, like, the Zappers, right, 0-4 run, came back, mm-hmm. made it into the playoffs. Board Apes have looked good all season. Like, what do you make of the matchup and the storyline headed into the championship, the people's, uh, the people's game? So are you are you one of these pocket aces that they refer to that migrated from the there there's a group of folks that were wild aces fans that then shifted alliances to the board of the football club. They call themselves pocket aces. I like that. No, I like this because this is the best color of a jersey I've ever seen. And I said, I have to own that. But I like that. I like the pocket aces. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, uh, but uh, to, to your point, uh, classic uh, opposing journeys, right, for the Zappers and the board of the football club. Board of Came out strong, uh, really showed you the the strength of Francois quarterback. They they ended up making sure they had a good defense uh, week after week as they were picking that each week up until the end of the regular season. So they jump out to five and zero, punch their ticket to the playoff. Francois has a has a little ankle foot situation, uh, ends up leaving a game early that he was probably going to rest anyway uh, in week six, and then he doesn't play in week seven. It doesn't really matter. They lose both of those games, but then they come back in the playoffs and and kind of return to form. Uh, in the FCF, as we said, you're never out of it. So they really had to weather a final storm from Edoki to, to, to make sure they reach the championship. But all signs point to them being a team that has been as good as they've been all season long. And, and they've secured one of the best defenses uh, for the playoffs. Now, conversely, the Zappers, 
such a roller coaster ride for them. As you mentioned, zero and four, then have have won every game since. Eight different quarterbacks during the regular season. They started with Terrell Owens. I think that was the focus early on. And uh, one thing we talked about, as weird as it's been, they have been at their best since they traded Terrell Owens. And I, and I think one of the things that came out of that was a little bit of the pressure came off to to try and make sure that they used him. If if you saw their first game. It was dedicated almost exclusively to trying to get him into the end zone, which happened at the end of the game, but they ended up losing uh, in fairly convincing fashion. So a couple of things happen. He moves on. You think that's the end of their story, and it actually sends them in the, in the opposite direction, upwards. They get Kelly Bryant, uh, the former Clemson quarterback. He comes on. He then has to leave. Jason Stewart comes in briefly. Bryant returns. Johnny Manziel is kind of here and there. Uh, and, and so now they've weirdly stumbled upon this like great mix of – Kelly Bryant, your starter, sprinkle in a little Johnny Manziel. Shunsi Thomas has become the primary super back. They've got themselves a decent defense. Uh, Terrence Williams has become their, their main receiver along with James Harden with no T.O. And it's, it's kind of uh, the perfect storm here, the classic peak at the right time. And, and they left no doubt in the playoff against the star. I mean, just blowing out the should have been stars, uh, really kind of serving notice that they very much belong in this people's championship. Uh, I'm curious, which of the new team owners, you know, we have the Bob Menneries of the world, right? And Marshawn Lynch, all that. I want to know who is the new team owners brought in Aoki or whatever that has most surprised you with like how all in they are in this. Well, it's interesting. So you have the OG division and and the ballers division, right? So we're fairly familiar with the OGs. Probably the one big, big switch up there was wild ace becoming should have been stars and Drewski becoming a big, a big owner with that group. But otherwise that OG, OG division has, has stayed fairly intact. We've seen some other uh, NFL guys get, get involved as well. And then on the ballers division, what's interesting with, with that NFT crew is that some of those groups almost feel like by committee, right? So it's not, it's not necessarily like the big, the big celebrity name outside of maybe a Steve Aoki that's kind of associated with it. What's been the, the most fascinating, I think, is to hear about how these teams have worked so well together, especially the Board 8 Football Club. Uh, we were talking uh, about that a bit this week. They run these kind of online forums where they get together and and uh, Coach Sean Latta was talking about it's like almost like being in like the coach's room. Like they're they're so intentional with what they want to do when it comes to play calling. Um, and, and and I would say that's been kind of the hallmark, uh, especially of these four new teams, these four NFT teams. And you kind of hit on. I know that's uh, can kind of be a hot button issue for some folks, but but at the end of the day, it's it's become kind of a way to use that product to have access to your team. And those people that are part of the NFT groups, they are, they are a heavily passionate group. They're really excited about what they have. Um, and, I, and I think seeing them work together to kind of assemble their teams and call plays has been pretty impressive. Yeah, I I think I'm old man cloud yelling at that point. Like USFL is doing it, XFL is doing it. You know, and I'm like I I think that if it's going to exist, right? I mean, obviously you guys have to be all in on it. But I do feel like that was something that I was very uh, not like super vocal, but I was like oh, I don't really like this. And I think that if everyone's doing it, it, it kind of is what it well, is. Well, look, and, and it, like it's certainly confusing, right? And I think some people, uh, you know, and I and and I won't say I'm I'm anywhere near an expert on it, but, but I will say at least in this league, there, there is you getting something for what you get, right? So you bought this NFT and now you get to do something with it, right? So if you want to look at it like a membership card or whatever else, uh, you know, you, you kind of process it that way. It does kind of gain you access to, to, uh, call plays and being involved with your specific team. And then the great thing about the FCF is like, if you are like, that is not my thing at all. We have these other four teams that are free to access and you kind of go that road. So I think that's been kind of fun. It ideally appeals to everyone, right? There's, there's a group over here that could do this or, or if you're the old man yelling at the cloud, which I totally get as well, you can, you can go down this lane as well. Uh, well, I, what, last question for me, I could talk to you for a long time, but I know you're busy. You got to get ready for the championship game. I will say that. So we had already booked our stuff to the USFL, uh, to do, we did a live show there for the kickoff. But when my wife found out that Steve Aoki was doing a live concert for the Bankers <laughs> football, I, she was like, I, I, I was like, that was the one thing that could sway her away. But, uh, I think you guys are, are doing tremendous stuff. Who do you have, uh, for the championship? Who do you have taking it all? 
Well, you know, as, as, as someone who calls the games, I always kind of, uh, balk at picking a winner, uh, because I never want to kind of give off a vibe of, you know, rooting for one team or another. And so it's super cliche. And I kind of always say like, I would, I would really just love to see a good game at the end, which is a really true statement. It sounds like, uh, you know, very much dodging the situation. Um, but, but honestly that, and, uh, for me personally, it's much more fun because I've done all every game you can think of where someone says this team is going to win by whatever. And for, for a, an announcer's point of view, it's kind of a bummer. Like if you start going into something knowing in, in your heart of hearts that, okay, this is going to be the outcome. It's, I don't know. It takes a little of the magic out of like what, what might be. And so I really do make a conscious decision um, to, you know, to kind of not pick a winner. I would say if you asked me like three weeks ago, it's like, okay, well it's, this is, this is the board eight football clubs thing to lose. And now after last Saturday, you really can't count the zappers. So it's, it's a long winded way of saying, I'm not going to give you an answer, but I'm very excited to see what happens on Saturday. Uh, well, it should be good. I wish you guys luck. Tell Patrick hi. We kind of have a tenuous relationship, but I think it's <laughs> good. I'm glad that we could get you guys on. I really appreciate Brian and everyone for reaching out to get you on. Uh, this has been good. Uh, Greg Meskel, uh, your lead play-by-play announcer for Fan Control Football. Thank you so much. Hey, happy to be here. Thanks again. Well, I'm excited. I just got my USFL jersey this week. Here, we're ready to talk week nine. We have Javon Alford of the Sporting News on, content producer over there. How are you doing, sir? Doing good. How about you? Glad to be on the pod. I'm good. I, I gotta say, it's hard to find good people covering USFL right now. We're, you know, we're trying to build this. They call it like the grassroots media. You know, they don't always do a lot of helpful things for us, right? They keep it a lot closer to the chest. But uh, what have you made? We're approaching week nine, which is crazy to think that we're almost done with the regular season of the USFL. What have you made so far? For, for me, for the USFL, I, I kind of, like you said, building this grassroots type of thing. Like for me, this goes back to like, I was like, you like how you're doing it. Like I was doing it for like arena football. So like I was in like the grassroots type of, you know, lane and era. So for me, for the USFL so far, I think it's been good. I can't wait for week nine, you know, definitely going to get some betting previews out for everybody. Cause I know that's kind of been very, very hot. Now people love putting money down on the USFL. So looking forward to it. Why, why do you say that? I, I say that we just be, I say that just because, you know, I think, you know, for as much as people don't want to say like they don't like spring football and don't watch spring football. I think the numbers start to tell us that people do like watching spring football. I mean, we just look at the latest ratings that came out. That's pretty good for a Sunday in June, you know, comparison to what any else, there ain't really nothing else going on, but to see those numbers, I think that's impressive. And, you know, just look at, you know, page views coming in or just people, you know, betting on the actual sport Do people want to bet on football and they don't matter what it is, you know, once they kind of figure it out and what it's all about, then they, they, and they enjoy it. And you just, you figure out if not so much about how in the NFL, where we're looking at against the spread and all that stuff here, if you know, the rosters, you know, who the quarterback play is, you'll be all right. So when you start, you know, covering this, right, obviously you're the sports betting. A lot of guys I've had on, you know, do that. Are, do you have passion for watching the game too, or is it just about covering it from that side of things? Oh no, I, I, I enjoy watching. I enjoy watching the game every, you know, I, when I watch the US, USFL, I think of, you know, I think about, you know, the excitement, you know, as, as the USFL has progressed, I think about the excitement that was around, you know, the XFL and I was watching the AF and I was watching, you know, the UFL, I was watching it. I was watching it all. So for me, you know, it's a little bit of the sports, obviously sports betting angle is always nice to, you know, dive down into, but it's also, you know, watching the games, watching players, you you know, that you might have seen in college, play in college or guys that you've seen, you know, get NFL shots. And you're like, oh, I didn't think he was going to be in the XFL and he's there. So you start making that recognition and that player and, that, and seeing the players that you might have saw playing in the NFL or in, you know, other leagues. Uh, so I'm looking here and I've got the email from the league. I, we got the games this weekend. Uh, so Houston and uh, Houston and Pittsburgh are both eliminated from the playoffs. I'm like such an idiot when it comes to like, okay, who's in and who's clinched and who's like, I like it when I watch like NFL network and they just have like, if you're above this line, like you're making it right. But you know, so obviously you know, Birmingham's in uh, New Jersey clinch uh, teams. I mean, I, we kind of expected Houston, right? Kevin Sumlin, my old co 
co-host Paul, very anti Kevin Sumlin and his work in Arizona. Obviously, the Kirby Wilson experiment is, is kind of a failure. Uh, what do you make of both of those teams being out, and or was it just expected? I think it definitely was. I think it definitely was expected. I mean, just looking specifically at Pittsburgh, just started with the whole, you know, pizza situation. That was just like a talent sign of like things to come. And I also look at both of those teams and how they constructed their rosters and the quarterbacks that they drafted. They weren't, you know, the best of the best. You know, obviously Houston drafted, you know, Clayton Thorson and Pittsburgh. They went through a, a myriad of quarterbacks from Kyle Aletta to, you know, Josh Love, who's now, you know, with the Panthers to Vad Lee. And then Vad Lee gets benched to go to Roland Rivers. So, I mean, when you just look at that from a Pittsburgh aspect, you can kind of tell, you know, where they was going. Because if you don't have consistent quarterback play, you're not going to go far. It doesn't matter what league you're playing in. You're not going to go that far. And the same thing, I think, with, you know, with, with Houston, you know, with them, with Sumlin going with Thorson, I get it because he's a name, a guy that has NFL experience. But this is coming from someone that's seen Thorson when he was with the Eagles in preseason. Wasn't that, he wasn't that, you know, that great of a quarterback. And then you look at the, you look at the weapons that Houston have, they have some guys, but it just hasn't equal enough. Their defense has been the, their saving grace for them to at least get one win this year. Yeah, I said, I think it was last week on the podcast, uh, Kirby Wilson really went like full Mad King, you know, like we're benching VAD and they're starting, they're like, I, I, you know, cause I like, I work weekends. I have a wedding schedule that's very unconducive to like watching a lot of like USFL stuff live in, but like I'll turn on, you know, and like Joel Cloud would be like, hey, Roland Rivers has never picked up a football before in the USFL and Kirby Wilson is starting him or like whatever it is. Like, it's always like, what the hell is he going on? I, I guess... I, I will say, you know, it's easy to bag on Kirby. I think with eight new coaches, Sumlin, I don't think was a failure, but to have seven of eight, like field, at least respectable teams. I mean, Houston, I'm, I'm clinching when I call them respectable, but I do think that that's pretty good odds that we had maybe six of eight that were like actually competent. Oh yeah. One, 100%. I, I would, I would agree with that. I think six to eight, you know, definitely, you know, they're, they've been, they've been competitive and they've gotten better, you know, We've seen those teams gotten better, right? We've seen the stars, you know, get better over these last, you know, uh, three weeks. You've seen, you know, Birmingham kind of come out of nowhere from the gate in week one and ride that momentum. Even Jersey. Jersey had to kind of figure out, you know, what their identity was going to be at quarterback and just on offense in general. And they've kind of figured that out now to where they're making, stuff a pop and making themselves a pop into a, like a potential, you know, contender in this league. And I think that's what you hope for the future, right? That you do have, you know, a good stable amount of teams and you can build on that and you can add the talent to go into year two, in the year three, you know, however long the league, you know, goes around and stays around for. Is the Birmingham home field uh, advantage real, right? Actually having the large crowds or, or, or is, and I mean this, or is Skip Holtz just head and shoulders better than anyone else? Cause it's not like they've had, I mean, and not that this is, it's like they've had 50,000 people screaming crazy. I mean, there's been fans and I'm not trying to do an attendance joke or anything, but like, why is Birmingham that much better than everyone else? Birmingham, I just think they, they, they're just a very, they're, for the most part, they're a very sound team on, you know, both sides. And for them, it starts defensively. Defensively, they they play well. I think that's really been their calling card this entire season. And the offense has kind of like came around and they started to, you know, figure out, like I said, they, they get Jamar Smith in the offense. Offense starts to pick it up, get it together. The, the weapons start, you know, playing well. They start to get a running game and developing that. Don't know how much you want to run with Bar Bro, Bo Scarborough because he's not picking up that many yards. But they start to figure an identity. I do think home field advantage plays a lot because it's always different. I mean, in sports, when you're playing, you know, with your home crowd, you know, supporting you, and other teams like, oh, so this is how it feels like, and you, and you hear them there, and there's some, and that's good to see that you know the city is supporting you know, the stallion. So I think it's that, and also think I think it's coaching, and they've gotten lucky in some games, but you know. Luck, you luck gets you being undefeated. So I don't think they're undefeated on accident. Uh, did you know a lot of Brian Scott before the season? All I knew from Brian, all I knew of Brian Scott was he went the Occidental 
and that he played in the spring league. I was, you know, people very high on Brian Wright. I mean, he's a friend of the show, came out, played really well, got hurt. Now he's been ruled out, you know, for the rest of the season. I think there were reports online uh, that, uh, you know, he's not coming back. You know, there had always been speculation, well, maybe he comes back for the playoffs, whatever. Are you surprised that the team with K- uh, Case Cookus was able to excel as much as they have, like really not missing the beat? Oh yeah, definitely. I, I'm, I was completely, I was completely su- surprised, and I think it goes back to them finding their identity, which is that ground game. Matt Colburn the second and Holland, they have just, you know, really taken off. Specifically Colburn, he's just been outstanding and really kind of set the tone. And what's been helping them win, you know, their what their last three games has been that, has been that. And then once you get the running game going, that opens up the passing game. If we know anything from Case Cook is back in his time in college, he can throw it around a little bit. So to see, you know, that run game get going and they can spread it out, it's worked for him. The only issue is Case Cook is, you know, he's mobile. We saw he was mobile a little bit, but that offensive line is is a little bit sketchy. So they got to get that, they got to get that together. Yeah, I mean, he had, it was it 79 yard run. It was very like Daniel Jones esque, like 79 yes. <laughs> run. It wasn't like a Lamar Jackson kind of, it was very like, we're, I, I it's kind of how, um, what's his face with Kansas city, Travis Kelsey. It's kind of like Travis Kelsey, like, isn't the most athletic guy, but just no one can seem to tackle him. It's very mm-hmm. weird, but case was very loose about there. That was a big, I mean, I think he won offensive player of the week. So uh, what'd you, what'd you make of that run? I thought it was impressive. I honestly couldn't believe how Michigan totally blew their gap assignments. How does that happen? Shout out to the blocking by the receivers. They did a great job blocking down the field without getting penalized. We see that so many times, guys, you know, getting the block in the back. So I, if that, it was honestly, I think that run was like the tale of like what was going on with two teams. It was that type of game for the Stars and for the Panthers. It's just like, this is just the type of season it's been for us. Uh, so heading into this weekend, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's tough, right? Some of these games don't matter as much, right? So the big game is Tampa versus new Orleans, right? So whoever wins that it's a win and in situation is that again, I'm a dummy dumb when it comes to playoff standings, but that's what we're looking at, right? Yeah. For new Orleans, it's a win and they're in, but if they lose, then that opens up the door for Tampa winning next week or new Orleans losing next in week 10. So it's a win and end for New Orleans, but if they lose, then the door is open for Tampa to win next week. I guess it's just weird. I mean, maybe it's just because it's a stronger division. It's just weird. New Orleans has seemingly played really well all season to kind of be in this precarious situation where they might not make it to the playoffs. Yeah, it, it's shocking, especially, like I said, when you look at what they have on their roster. I mean, offensively, they have a nice receiving core, you know, with Jonathan Adams, with Taewon Taylor, with Poindexter, um, you know, Johnny Dixon. The run game has been good. You know, Kyle Sloter, you know, didn't have a great game in, 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 in against Birmingham, and that's a game that you got to win, right, especially when you know playoff seasons on the line. you got to win those games. And even defensively, I think defensively, the Breakers have been one of the, you know, better, you know, defenses, you know, in the league. I think they're like second and third in scoring defense. So they've been pretty good. So like you said, for them to be in this predicament, it just shows just how when you have a condensed league like this and this condensed schedule, every game matters. It's hard. It was, but you know, we're used to the NFL season, right? You got 17 games now. You can you, you can snooze a couple weeks. I mean, you look at this here, you know, four and four versus five and three. It, it, like you said, it really condenses it down. We talked Kirby, right? Kind of the failure that is Pittsburgh. What coach have you been most impressed by so far this season? Most impressed by? Um, I would say Jersey. I would say Jersey just because we didn't know what we were going to get from them because obviously they drafted Ben Holmes in the first round of the draft. And then, you know, he, they released them. And I think he was playing in the CFL in preseason, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So to see, they move on from him, you know, they, you know, they got Luis Perez on there. They didn't get Deandre Johnson and they kind of, like I said, have this two quarterback system with Mike Riley, but they don't panic. They figure it out and they get it and they get it done. And I think that's what we've seen from Riley, even in the XFL, right? He just knew, you know, what to, to get things done. And I think that's carried over with them. So I've been definitely impressed with them. And I'm, you know, I'm probably one of the more exciting teams that I've, you know, seen this season just because they don't change for nobody. They're going to do what they're going to do, which is we're going to run the ball and we're going to, you're going to have to try to stop us. You're going to try to stop Trey Williams and Darius Victor and good luck trying to stop Turpin. If we get our run game going. 
Uh, it's weird. You know, you have Luis Perez, right? And everyone talks about, okay, like his shortcomings as a quarterback, right? Like maybe he's not the most you know, accurate or doesn't have the biggest arm. But I just think there's something to be said that he's been around so long, has been to all these different things. Like if I'm even an above average quarterback that I've just got so much experience, it's still going to put me at a level above some of these guys. Like I thought Brian kind of maybe some of the, the higher level Jordan Te'amu, they've struggled a little bit right with decision making maybe it's a big stage for him which is weird because tom has been on practice squads and stuff but like it's weird how some of these guys that we thought would be good kind of fail luis perez here we didn't have the highest expectations as as at least met or exceeded those no perez has been solid and i think that's something we saw even going back you know even you know in the af and you know He's just been that type of solid quarterback. He doesn't, like you say, he doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. He runs the offense the way you want it to be run. And I think, you know, that's, I think any, you know, any quarterback in the league can learn from that, right? Like you might throw an interception, you might turn the ball, okay. But if you stay ready and you're always ready, I think there's always going to be opportunity for you. And I think he's, you know, the perfect example of that. He's always, he was always ready. And he's, you know, he's paying dividends, right? You know, he's kind of, you know, DeAndre Johnson having gotten that starting job back because he's been playing well. So that's just a testament to the type of to the type of quarterback he is, type of professional he is, because he knows how these spring leagues function and he just goes about his business. So we have Tampa right there in the marquee game, right? You know, they're against Breakers. That's the big Fox game, you know, one one uh, Pacific. So what is that, 11 Eastern? Uh, do you think Te'amu, are, are we bouncing back here? I watched, was it two weeks ago? He had like three interceptions within like five minutes or something. I mean, it's been, it's been challenging. Do you, do you expect him to kind of figure it out finally? I hope he can. You know, I was very excited when I saw Te'amu get, you know, into the X, I mean, into the, um, in the USFL, <laughs> just because I got XFL on my mom because he played so well in the XFL. It was like him and PJ Walker as like the gold standards. And, you know, he haven't kind of replicated that success. And partly because, you know, the wep- you know, the, the, the weapons in tent with the bandits haven't been the greatest. You know, he doesn't have that standout wide receiver. I think Jonathan Franklin might be his best wide receiver, you know, but he has some tight ends. Ground game isn't okay. You hope that he picks it up, you know, and builds off what he did, you know, last week in their win. Because, like I said, the previous week, it wasn't good. I watched that game the previous week. It was just it was horrible. And then part of it, and part of that was, you know, coaching as well. When you see a quarterback trouble, you got to get him in rhythm. And he found his rhythm once he got into that no huddle offense. The ball was flying. He knew where he wanted to go with the passes. So I think if they just do that, they got a chance. And it's going to be tough because this New Orleans team, very tough on, very tough on defense. But I think if Tayamu, this is the moment where he can kind of, you know, put some respect on his name when it comes to, you know, to, to spring football. Uh, what do you think of Trace Atkins performing at the playoffs? So that'll be in, uh, so next week's week ten. So in two weeks, what what do you make of that? Is kind of sandwiching them in between the doubleheader of of the two playoff games. That is a very uh, interesting <laughs> idea. I think it's almost like I don't know. Maybe you're trying to do like a little Super Bowl esque type thing where you just have you know the the concert in the middle of the game. You know, you got some air time to fill between what the first games what at three and then the next one's at like eight Eastern that night. So that day. So try to fill, try to fill some time. I mean, if you got a concert for the semifinals, I mean, what are you going to have for the actual championship game? I mean, this is what I will say though, just to give a little constructive criticism. I'm I'm known as Mr. A- Mr. Anti USFL. Like they did this too, right? The whole thing all season is one ticket will get you into all the games for the day, right? So it's ten bucks, mm-hmm. whatever. But then they schedule these games. So like Saturday, you have a game at ten, so that's ten, eleven, 12, so it's a one. These are Pacific time, but whatever. And then the next game is not on until three, so you have a two hour break in between. So like you're asking people, are we going home? Are we coming back? Are we getting beer in your body? We're coming back in. And it's the same with this playoff game. Like you said, the game's at three. So that's three to six. Trace isn't going to play for two hours. So Trace, but no. it just so you're asking people, you want them to be at the stadium from three to eleven PM. Like nobody is going to do that. Like I, I I understand the theory of it, but it's like you need to sandwich the games closer, have Trace play for 45 minutes or whatever. I get you got to get personnel in and out and all that stuff. But if you're expecting to keep people around, 
I don't know. BC Lions are doing that this weekend. They have like one Republic opening for the the mm-hmm. home opener, right? They have a, the, Amar Domen's the new big owner of the BC Lions, and they're bringing in that. And like, you'll be curious to see how many people stick around for the BC CFL game. But with this, I'm like, that is eight hours on a Saturday in Canton, Ohio. Like, I don't know if I'm sitting there at the Hall of Fame that long. Yeah, that's yeah, like you said, that's a long time to commit, and you know, hopefully, it's not a blazing hot day as well because that's another thing you got to consider like i don't know if i if it's like 90 degrees outside i don't know if i could commit to just you know staying like hey i want to stay in can for like eight hours at the field just to see so i mean they got to do better hopefully like you say hopefully in gear two they figure it out and be like all right we tried this in year one it didn't really work so well time and wise let's revamp that for a uh, year two yeah, i mean i just can't I don't know what the rash. I mean, I, I, I know what the rationale because they have the TV slots, right? So you have to figure out the TV slots that way. But like, it, it's just killer that no one, if the games were back to back, they're not double headers. It's, it's, no. it's two games with two hours in between. Like I don't, and, and we, we were at Birmingham for the kickoff. Like there's, I think four bars across the street. I mean, there's just not, it's not like you're in like downtown Nashville where it's like, well, let's like go leave the Preds game. Let's go get some beer on music row. And then we'll come Mm -hmm. back and see like you're, it's very far away from anything to ask these people to stick around. It's very interesting. Yeah, most definitely. So hopefully, like I said, hopefully they figure it out and, you know, maybe, maybe they might move it around. Hopefully that's the thing, right? You keep it in Canon this year, you move it to another place. Like you said, maybe a metropolitan type area like in Nashville where it's like, hey, we have a concert, but we also have this and we have this going on just to, you know, liven it up and bring some more excitement to what you're actually doing and putting out on the field. Uh, so, I mean, rounding out here before we go, is this Birmingham's world? We're just living in it. I mean, who who do you see in the championship game here? Like, what are you? Uh, what what do you expect? Oh, that's a that's a good one. That's a good one. But with the way that things are unfolding in the South, I kind I definitely see Birmingham. You know, in 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 into the championship game. I mean, I don't know if even if Tampa would get the spot, they would be able to take down Birmingham just just because of the way Birmingham plays. You know, defense and and just if they get their offense going and not turn the ball over, they'll be all right. But on the other side, I mean, it's tough, right? I mean, Philly, 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 and obviously in that semifinal round, like Philly and Jersey could be that best game. I think just so. because just because both both teams are going to come with almost the same mindset of running the football is just going to be which defense is going to break first. And I think that's a game that could come down to the wire, especially with, like I said, both teams playing. And if, you know, if Philly gets there, I don't think they stand a chance against Birmingham just because that offensive line is, uh, is just uh, it doesn't, it's not holding up well right now. But if we get Jersey, that would be a nice rematch from, from you know, from what we've seen from these two teams, you know, in the early season. So right now, I'm going to say Jersey and Birmingham. I think that's going to be an exciting game between those two. I will tell you, if it is, if it's the repeat of the kickoff, I think that was the CFL last year because I think the first game it was at Hamilton at Winnipeg. That was the kick. I'm trying to remember. And then the the Grey Cup was Winnipeg at Hamilton. And so uh, it'd be interesting to see kind of if if it's full circle there. If it's if, if it, did did these ten weeks matter at all, or was it just week one <laughs> and, then, and then the championship? Uh, any final thoughts before I let you go? I appreciate you hopping on. Hey, no, I appreciate you having me on, man. It's great, you know, talking USFL, seeing, you know, outlets like yourself, you know, promote, you know, other leagues, other football leagues, you know, spring leagues. This is the kind of stuff that we need because there's not a lot of it going on, you know, outside of, you know, you know, people might mention it here and there. So to see, you know, people like yourself and, you know, XFL News Hub, CFL News Hub, those guys, you know, continuing to build and grow the games, you know, XFL now, USFL, I think is great. Uh, Javon Alfred here at Sporting News. Really appreciate it. We'll get you back on here. We'll figure out kind of post, whatever this post, USFL World. I am afraid that come July 3rd, you know, 4th, that USFL drops off the map for six months and they kind of close up their social media. I hope that they at least have a skeleton crew around to kind of keep things going. But that is kind of my fear is that we, we, we will hit a lull here following the July kind of excitement. I hope not. I mean, hey, I, I like I like what the league is doing by signing these young players that within this this year's draft class. So I think if they keep on doing that, which I think is going to bring excitement and eyes to the league, then it hopefully won't be a quiet off season. Sounds good. Thanks again for your time. Hey, no problem. 
Huge special thanks again to all of our guests and everybody that worked to get this together this week. You know, Lucas over at CFL Offices, really appreciate you getting Randy Ambrosi on the show. Obviously, special thanks to you know Commissioner Ambrosi, busy guy. You know, the week of the CFL kickoff, I could not be more appreciative for him taking the time to sit down. I know our audience really appreciates that. Evan and Brandon over at XFL News Hub talking through all that stuff. Darren Heitner as well coming on, breaking down the together lawsuit. Really, really. Uh, truly do appreciate Fan Control Football reaching out, getting Greg on the show, and obviously Greg as well calling in from his hotel room, you know, before the kickoff game. I mean, this is, we're all doing this stuff, you know, when we can in the off time, you know, traveling and everything. Everyone's working hard to, to you know, get this content out for you guys. And then Javon Alfred as well coming on to talk USFL. I think that's it for me. I don't think this was a crazy long episode. I think all the interviews were kind of manageable length, but hopefully you guys enjoy. Again, if you like the content that we are doing on here, like and subscribe. TheMarkCast.com slash review is a great place. You can leave a review. We sell merchandise. If you don't like all the CFL, you know, USFL stuff, you get some MarkCast merch, got some nice hats and, uh, you know, sweatshirts, things like that on there. But again, just, you know, a like and subscribe, sharing the video anywhere you see it. That's what matters the most to me. Sorry, I'm getting, uh, I've, I've rambled long enough today. I'm running out of voice, but just really appreciate it again. You know, we do this for the love of football. We do this for the love of the fans and the players and the staff and support and everything else. So thank you guys again. Thank you, Randy, CFL office everyone at the news hubs for supporting me and uh, have a good day. Thanks.